David. Hey, Michael. How's it going? Good. How you doing? All right. Well, let's get started here. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this very special edition of Truth Warrior. I'm your host, David Whitehead, and I'm doing this interview on behalf of Modern Knowledge. You can check out the work we've been doing there at modernknowledge.ca. And we are just on the heels of um, an absolutely groundbreaking event with Michael, Michael Tessarian, who we're going to be speaking with today. And it was focused on his newest thesis entitled The Female Illuminati. And I have to say, in all the different areas that I've looked into and the work that I've, that I've been privy to looking at, this is one of the most comprehensive uh, thesis that I've seen put together. I sat there literally even though I was up in the control room doing all the background work, I was literally just glued to the screen. And I think that this is one of those programs that uh, if you haven't gotten into this subject, you're going to learn something. If you've been in this subject for years, you're going to learn something. And I think that it's, it's, it's just so valuable to go back and take a refreshing look at the opposing forces and what's really going on in the world and what's really behind it. And Michael, I know you've put a lot of years and a lot of work into uh, this body of work. And maybe just let us know a little bit about what initially inspired that for you and what that path was for you to, to coming to that conclusion with the female Illuminati. Okay, well, the, the whole idea started right about uh, 2000, between 2004 and 2006 when I was doing the Origins and Oracle series, one of the programs within that series, it was a lengthy series, very much inspired by what Joseph Campbell had done uh, back in the uh, 70s and 80s, you know, an incredible series that he put together and it kind of showed you what you could do, just sit on a desk or, you know, sit behind a desk and just go for it, you know. And after all these frustrating, uh, shorter, especially in those days, in the, in the late 90s, I was doing interviews, but they seemed to be so compressed. They were usually in TV studios where, you know, it was just chopped to hell. And so I started this series of my own, you know, uh, produced it on my own. And uh, one of the programs in that was on this similar tradition. It was more about the suffix, as we're now calling them, you know, the uh, positive uh, sisterhood, the positive goddess tradition that is certainly, you know, not occulted. This is openly known. And uh, I wanted to look into that because at that time my concern was the, the, mag the malignant masculinity, which we're now calling the sort of malignant patriarchy, right? Sim same term, you know, all, all these years later, 17 years later, I mean, uh, no, about 10 years, started this uh, process, uh, got the DVDs out to people in about 2006, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So it's about 10, 10 years, you know, gap. But I was calling it the malignant patriarchy then, and just looking, as many have done, into the whole question of uh, the pension for violence, the war of the sexes, and so on. So it kind of started there. But when I was researching that subject matter and looking into these apocryphal texts, uh, like the Book of Enoch and others, it, it did become obvious that uh, something was up in the sense that... Uh, uh, we don't hear about a battle or, or a strife or a war, you know, uh, that took place between these fallen angels uh, 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 and, and, and the women. In fact, you really don't even hear about a war with any of the, of the human race, which is extremely peculiar. You, you, have, you have all this other talk, all this garbled uh, information. You have a lot of uh, peculiar mythographs creeping up that almost seem insignificant, you know, there's so much emphasis on the seed of this person and the seed of that person and the generation of this person and the generation of that person. And then, uh, you know, interspersed in the middle of all of this, you get, you get um, information about cataclysm, and yet it's just sort of glossed over. You know? So there's a lot of emphasis on sort of non-essentials and then this uh, glossing over of things that you would think would be incredibly important for historians, you know, even in ancient times, to, to write down. So it, it seems quite peculiar why there's omissions there. So that's kind of where the seed was. And as, as many years went by, and it just kept mulling on my mind, kept, you know, in other work that I'd be doing, I'd sometimes come across the same, you know, a lot of my work involves looking at these ancient texts. And so it wasn't just with the, uh, that DVD, it was also with the, uh, um, you know, Atlantis work that I've done. So in the end, with Atlantis work and the, and the DVD on the goddess tradition, you know, and people can still see that original. If they go to unslave.com, they'll find that the, most of the Origins and Oracles series that I did is up there now free. You can watch it. So, uh, you know, I welcome people to go and watch the one called Divination and the Goddess Tradition, 
Uh, my interest there was about divination, about some of the ancient uh, hoary uh, rites, uh, the customs, the teachings, these archetypal teachings of this nursery age uh, and this, this uh, positive goddess tradition. So once I had set that in place and then had addressed the malignant masculinity that certainly goes up to our present day, but has had holocausts and genocides against women, you know, like the famous witch hunts, which cost the lives of nearly 9 million women, and it could even be more. And just, the, just that whole ethos of suppression, you know, the numbers are bad enough, but what would even drive men to do such atrocities? What on earth? And then you hear the fe you know, feminist writers and other uh, writers, non-feminist anthropologists writing about that man has been attacking women, you know, the rise of these great solar powers in BC era, in which there was, there was waves of a suppression. Biblical scholars know all about this rise of, of the Abraham when he's meant to talk to God. And from that moment, there's a major uh, shift in the status quo in the sort of a, in religious terms, but also in polit political terms. You know, why would that happen? And then just one thing leads to the other. And then like we did in the very early part of the female Illuminati in, in, in the first sections, one thing I also had continued to study was not only, as I say, the prevalence of this tradition, but the fact that the symbolism, like the caduceus, the tree of life, this was incredibly replete through the Bible, and yet it was it was symbolism that arose elsewhere. It, it wasn't necessarily patriarchal, you see. So that's, that was another thread of looking at this welter of symbolism, pentagrams, you name it, crescent moons, and just starting to realize that, look, you know, that doesn't seem to originate from a, a patriarchal source. And then my interest, which has been not from the 90s or 2006, but from the 80s, symbolism, right, corporate symbolism. I'm, I'm studying this over here about this female symbolism. And, of course, that is jogging my interest again. And we, we, I'm seeing all of this in, in, our, in our world. I'm seeing all of this in our, uh, in our media space as well. So suddenly these two things just, you know, collided again, like I had done several other times in my occult studies, but now there was an immediate, so geez, here I am studying this, and again, there's this tie-in, because I'm seeing all of these symbols that I'm looking at in mythology, I mean, right down to very detailed symbols, you know, which we've looked at in that program, and uh, here, here they are again, turning up uh, in the corporate media, and even more so now as we move uh, past the millennium with all these rock videos and pop videos and this exaltation of these uh, female pop stars, these sort of airheads, and they have all this symbolism around them that certainly you know, it's impossible for them to have manifested or thought up, but somebody did. And some of it's extremely debauched. I mean, I don't know about you, but uh, even people who are quite lenient with, with, with artistic license. This is monstrous. It looks awful, right? It's really, really hideous. And, so, and uh, so what's it all about? So there's two, three, four threads like this that finally start coalescing around about 2010 and 11. But I was busy then with the post-humanism tour and, and program, which to me was a seminal. And so um, it didn't really dawn on me to the, actually do a presentation on it. But then I did the psychic vampirism after post-humanism, and that is, a, has a, is actually connected in many ways. It's not as, as different as people would think. There's, there's a lot of connections there, too, to this female Illuminati subject. So it seems like a, a evolution. But again, like everything in my life, nothing's planned that, that way. It's just more like the evolution, getting things off the table, making some room, and then uh, doing justice. Also, it was very important to do justice. That's why this thing is a magnum opus of 10 bloody hours. You know, I mean, it had to be. Because uh, I said, if I'm going to sit down and do this, it has to be like the origins and oracles. There can't be any editing. There can't be any cutting corners, you know. Um, one has to do complete justice to this because the audience will want that. They won't want to have only a smidgen of what you're talking about. They're going to want a, want a whole package because you're dealing with masons and secret societies, things that would take 10 hours on their own just the symbolism alone, you know, or female psychology, whatever, whatever angle you're coming at is a vast program in itself. And as I've said already from the beginning, I'm just kickstarting this. This is not by any means the last word on this subject. I'm just kickstarting something that I hope will be talked about, you know, for decades. And it's, it really is incredible because I remember listening to the Brotherhood of Death series that you did a while back, talking more about the, you know, the, the negative patriarchal aspects and what was going on behind the scenes with what's, you know, generally uh, accepted by people in terms of research into the Illuminati, secret societies. But then even at that point, you were bringing in information that was blowing holes in what most researchers were looking at. A lot of researchers got lost in this idea that okay well if we're talking about the Illuminati we're talking about secret societies 
we're talking about something that is more of a Catholic order. But then you also have these Protestant tie-ins behind the scenes, and you have these Jewish tie-ins behind the scenes, and you have all these different groups that seem to be playing ball together. And I remember you bringing up the importance of looking at royalty and the history of royalty and the history of these families. I live in Canada, Michael, and we are uh, pretty much a crown corporation here run from England. Um, our regent is the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth, and anytime the royal family makes its presence known here, our prime ministers, the entire cabinet, everybody gets down on their knees, they roll out the red carpet, they bring in the band, they've got the horses and the chariots and the whole thing. And I'm just, uh, I'm blown away by the connections going from that original Brotherhood of Death uh, series that I've probably reviewed countless times just because there's so many notes in there. And then now bringing it into this other side, looking at the, f the female aspect, um, that's incredible. And I remember the video that you did Sorry to jump around a lot, but the video you did about the Queen's coronation uh, and talking about the symbolism just in that. Um, mm. How do we get people out of this confusing state of thinking that the adversary is just one of these religious orders or just one of these groups? There seems to be something else that is a lot bigger that's going behind the scenes. Well, you're right about, uh, first of all, I'd like to say you're right about this uh, fixation on the royalty, which is uh, more astounding. Uh, you even have in Ireland now people who once upon a time presented themselves with a different hat as being rebels and rebel leaders and freedom for the Irish people. Get the, you know, get the band out, shake hands, there's Prince Charles, we're good mates, right? Yeah. And the symbolism behind that is so utterly evil. I mean, Bobby Sands, there's men who, who died, you know, there's men who perished in agony for the cause. Not, I don't whether you agree with the cause or not. You know, there were heroes here whose lives were dedicated to that cause. I mean, what they're being sold out. Their memory has been totally sold out. Once upon a time, Jerry Adams was, you know, censored by Margaret Thatcher. If he came on TV, they, they blocked out the sound. Mm -hmm. so, so how can how can suddenly just the elapse of time? I don't see anything else seismic that has taken place where that status quo should have changed. But suddenly the status quo has changed because these rebels have donned the new hat. Well, that doesn't justify my work, like you say, in Brotherhood of Death and... Uh, in uh, Irish origins and other uh, presentations that I've done where I point this out, the, you know, like the occult history of Ireland, stuff like that. So when, when it comes to getting people to be savvy, it's almost like the media helps us because all you have to have is a little bit of history knowledge, not going back even that far. And people can see the preposterous contradictions. It's just that you have to point them out. So you put it on a website or you make a little video about it and people scoff at it, you know, and think, what is this guy? He's crazy or something. You're like, oh, yeah, I'm crazy. I got nothing better to do, right? So, you know, but then what you do is it, it, it twigs, it, it, like it, it stays in the mind. It's, it sounds so preposterous in one way. That's a good thing because if it sounds preposterous and you're, you're ready to scoff at it at the pub with your mates, it also means that you're going to remember it. Hmm. And then what a lemon you're going to look like when you're sitting in the same pub watching the same TV going, is that Jerry Adams shaking hands with Prince Charles? I must have drank too much. <laughs> that's exactly. impossible. Yeah. Like that's, that's, a, that's some, you know, Saturday Night Live skit, right? No, it is not. That's history, and it's occult history, and it's telling you bloody something, right? So start thinking back, and then, as you said, start looking at the preposterous nonsense of this frontal thing that they give you about, oh, we're all different, all broken up. Find out that the original Zionists were the elite before a Jew even knew that Israel was meant to be his homeland. It's the Lord such and suches, right? Lord Sykes and previous, I've got them all listed. So all of these uh, proto-Zionists were aristocracies of England, obsessed with Old Testament lore, which we, if you really decode it, it's atonism, but let's just forget that if it's too far of a stretch for people. There's all this incredible names that crop up, you know, the predecessors to your Lord Palmerston's, Lord Balfour's, Lord Sykes, the Cecil Rhodes crowd, and Shelbourne. You know, like you're talking about Canada is infested with this royalism, you know. Uh, you ask an Australian person, so what city do you come from? Oh, I'm from Melbourne, mate. Is that Lord Melbourne? <laughs> that it might have been named after as all the streets yeah, all oh, the streets oh, here oh. have royalty, Lord Rutherford and all, it's That's everywhere, it. it's unbelievable, uh, and you go Wellington. to different cities, it's the same. England is, yeah, Ireland, it's Wellesley, mm. who the hell is Wellesley, That's uh, that's the geezer, you know, that had the Battle of well, you know, yeah. Wellington, Duke of Wellington, his real name was Wellesley, Grosvenor, right, so people are walking past these streets every day, never even ask, who is the Grosvenor family, why is my, all these streets named after, well, he's the guy who owns half of London, so just in case you didn't know, like, right, you know, so, and all, as I say, in, in countries where you'd never think of seeing this, but that's cluing you in. 
And then the next level down, as we've emphasized through and through, and especially in the female Illuminati whole sections were given over to that, is again the civic architecture. That's telling you something. You know, uh, while you've been riding your skateboard up and down on it, those statues mean something. They're royal. Why is it that there's a lion with the Queen Boadicea? And on one level, it's Queen Boadicea outside Parliament building, those giant horses, the chariot that she's on, and this queen. But strip away what they've told you about it, and you find out that outside the Houses of Parliament, right, you know, Right there is a, is a chariot of a powerful female queen with the whores, the horses. Does anybody decode what that means? Oh, that's queen Bodicea, take a photograph. That's it. Hmm. Bodicea, in what way could she possibly have any meaning whatsoever to London, to the Houses of Parliament, to that park? That's just a cover. That's just something stuck on for the, for the, you know, for, for the tossers to just take a photograph of. Nobody questioning, my God, what is this? This is a incredible stuff here. So my job was to do that, is to look just that little bit deeper and, and then uh, look at the civic architecture, the number 13, these rivers, the proximity of a, of a flowing river, either in the civic architecture, a fountain type thing, the underground stream, then that connects to the Eye of Horus. I mean, the thing just starts opening up. So it's not for everyone. So partly your question can be answered that way, is it really isn't for everyone, but it is for this certain group who know that they've been lied to, have that positive anger, that positive uh, feeling of... Uh, Fury that they've been lied to, not not the destructive kind of anger, you know, stick on the Pantera album and punch yourself in the face, not like that. It's the creative, right, anger, the fury of Beethoven, right, the fury, the beauty, the beauty of it, in which you say, I'm tearing all illusion aside. It's like Frodo caught in the web of Shelob, right? You can just sit there and go, well, yes, that's it then. Let them, let them suck out my juices. Or do you fight to the last iota of your being and if you fight you might actually get free there's no guarantee of that but there's also the chance that you will indeed free yourself and then once you freed yourself there's a good chance that you can go on and free other people no matter how they smart at the remedy they don't want that sharp sh shriek you know uh, method but uh, some will some will also have that rage that positive rage within them to say yeah enough already of these lies I, I, I feel it I'm surrounded by it I know I've been lied to and I don't want that. So all of this teaching, all of it, no matter what angle you're coming at, it's all about trying to awaken that uh, blue flame of anger, that spirit of rebellion, which I've written about so much. And we're in the age. To me, the whole 2012 thing, you know, under the clutter of what everybody was uh, babbling about that, foaming at the mouth about, you know, the end of the world. Actually, it's the end of man, one phase of mankind, one kind of humanness. And it's also on the positive side, and there is astrology there to back this up, it's an age of rebellion in which now we have what our forefathers didn't have, which is the ability to look again at that which we've taken for granted and maybe even squeegee it all off and, and, and look at it you know, from a different angle. So that's what female Illuminati is. It's a carry on of everything I've done before, but it's looking at it in a, in a very profound new angle, not as some accusation towards womankind. Women kind of suffered under the same sisterhood we have suffered under, man has suffered under. See, so it's about freeing the whole human race from this evil archy which has um, not only got male servants, but it's also spawned, right, as a reaction, an evil, more malignant patriarch. So this thing is rotten to the core. It's rotten in itself, and it's rotten in what it caused as a reaction. And we are victims of those two things. So it's not just as, strict, it's not just as nice and clean and safe and cliched as what most feminists want to tell you. Well, it's just man, you know. Hmm. It's just man. That's the end. I mean, you know, we can write a lot of volumes on it, but it boils down to that men are evil, women good. And we, we bought that. Everybody in the human race, without question, has bought that. We've been handed an explanation for the war of, of the sexes, the war of the genders, the terrible atrocities towards women. We've been handed this cliche, which good men know is utterly nonsense. There was good men in the past. Men are responsible for building civilization and the good parts of it as well as the evil. So how can there this be this wholesale then uh, um, accusation towards the male's gender? It just doesn't fit. But it's a cliche that most people have accepted. So I haven't accepted it. So then it was an idea of saying, no, I accept parts of it, but can we look deeper? And when you do, when you go, look, I've always said, don't worry about the science of the modern age. That's neither here nor there. And they're changing their story every five minutes. Go to the lore. Go to your ancestral lore, like the way Velikovsky has done and so many other great people like Joseph Campbell. Go to the lore that is oral, that had, uh, although you have to decode it, obviously. But once you've done that, you find that it's a very trustworthy source because these American native elders didn't lie. Lying wasn't in their nature. The ancient druids and the bards didn't lie. Lying was not in their nature. What they did use is kenning, 
What they did use is allegory. What they did use is mythographs. What they did use is astrotheology motifs. And the great Gerald Matthews and Alvar Borg Coons were the men that taught me how to decode it. So once you have those keys of decipherment, then it's inevitable, like any good detective, you have to follow the road where it leads and not go, well, I, you know, I've got the tools, but shit, I'm not going down there. That's for you, mate. I'm not. No, that's wrong. That's bad science. That's also bad conscience. You must go into wherever it goes. And you have to also go with a certain amount of courage and bravery, because if you come out with stuff that people in the world don't want to hear, well, what are you going to do, back off? Well, luckily, I've not backed off. I've continued you know, to plow on, and here we are in 2015 now, and finally the work got done in May, thanks to your help and Chris's as well. You know, it's a magnum opus. It's, uh, I got to everything that I wanted to cover, but it's certainly not the last word. There's still more that you know, other people can contribute and have been still. I've been getting a welter of stuff. A, a man sent me an incredible picture. I think it was from uh, Europe were in a corporate building that he had been passing and he had been just he just watched the thing a few days before and he took this photograph of this huge vesica this is inside one of these corporate buildings shaped like the womb with water inside it and he says i'm seeing it everywhere mate i'm seeing it everywhere yeah well, well yeah exactly why is that that shape why has it got water in it why is it you know clearly a womb symbol yeah that symbolism element and when i was watching the production myself and i reviewed it a few times since uh, that that's really where the core is and when you're looking at these symbols in that way and understanding that we're talking about a malignant form of the feminine energy or the feminine spirit or this this the references to this dark sisterhood in the same way that you know you were referencing that man 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 as well has had both a positive and negative expression and it seems like the whole human race in general is in that space of being in a state of amnesia where we've forgotten our history we've forgotten to go back to the uh the ancient symbols and the stories and the legends and our, our what they were trying to warn us about through that and a lot of people look at it and they go oh well that's just a design they, they design the buildings like this just to it's some kind of artistic expression right but when you start to see the similarities all throughout these different types of buildings of power oh. throughout the world that are measured there's people that go and measure this they're using google maps and other tools now and they're measuring the connections between these sites around the world you know the city of london to the vatican to the pyramids and all this and there's an exact uh degree in which these structures are laid and there's an exact way that they're built so they're not that particular the kind of work that it would take to make it that particular as opposed to just throwing up a building and plastering on a nice symbol that looks good it doesn't explain it away the symbolism is uh, the root of telling that deeper story which is why when you pointed it out and linked it all together it's a it's an absolute mind explosion. And again, like we said, we almost stopped the program at the point where we were talking about René Le Chateau because it's like, can we just stop here? Go to the play, buy a ticket and go. And don't even, you don't even have to take a guidebook. You don't have to read any of the occultists who are talking about it, like Henry Lincoln or the Holy Grail people or David Wood. Don't even bother taking that stuff. Just go there and use the evidence of your own eyes as a sort of amateur detective. And then come back and tell me what ostensibly Catholic secret society, the Knights Templar and the Knights of Sion, right, these Order of Sion, what were they doing filling the landscape with all of those shrines, churches, symbols of Baphomet, uh, the numerology, uh, uh, the underground caverns, and then the, the pentagrammal, you know, the, the geometry, the earth geometry. What's going on? That's not an anomaly either. That's something massive. And then when you go to even the local know-it-all in that area, they'll just say, well, that's all, haven't you read the books? It's a cult of Mary. What? So uh, the whole thing just breaks down the cliches what we've been bought, bought into. You know, it's just I've done that work in other smaller areas and then suddenly found these things. And it's like you go, look, I can only look at the evidence that they put in front of me. Like I've emphasized time and time again, I'm just looking at their artwork. I'm just looking at their works. You come along with me and I'll show you something. It's like walking through a museum. Uh, but you come with me and you find the masculine symbolism in any of this. A lot of long beards. Well, goats have long beards. Doesn't make it a high priest. So you can stick on a beard on something. It doesn't it masculinize that, but it's the only thing behind even God, Jehovah. You, you've got incredible stuff there about the serpent, God, the sun lover of the goddess, the consort of Asherah, all of, the, all of this kind of thing. Somebody talking about Baphomet, somebody sent me a photograph the other day, again, after watching the program. You remember the old AOL company? Mm, yeah. America Online? The American they used to have a pyramid, and then in it was two crescent moons sort of juxtaposed. Huh. Two crescent moons, just like you see in the Baphomet symbol of the two crescent moons. Wow. And, you know, it's like, and I forgot about that logo. And, and the guy was saying there, you talked about the Baphomet and the, 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 the menstrual moon. Menstruation means a changing moon. 
And in the Baphomet symbol, you see the white crescent moon and you see the black crescent moon. And this guy said there is an AOL symbol. They've only chosen two, what, you know, two symbols, and that's, it's these two crescent moons inside a pyramid, for God's sake. And the pyramid we extrapolated was entirely a goddess symbol without any masculine connotation at all. And just in case you didn't get that, they made it 13 levels in the, in the dollar bill, because 13 is the cardinal female symbol. They, and then the, and, you know, the, the actual mottos of 13 letters and all the rest of it, just to emphasize to those who are initiated. So it's not the layman. The layman is not going to get hold of this at all. It's beyond him. You see, to him, 13 is just a number after 12 and before 14. What's the big deal? Yeah. <laughs> okay, right? You know, it's like, Michael, Michael, I looked it up in the dictionary. No way, mate. No way. Genesis? That doesn't mean genes of Isis or nothing. That, that just means like beginning, like it says in the book. What, what book exactly did you pick up? Well, the book written by the masters. You know, the, my masters, the overlords, I read their book. They, they don't say anything what you say. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> Good. I'll see you later then. Okay. Right. I'm wrong. You're right. Bye bye. You know, why don't you go on also the same book then and look up connotative. <laughs> yeah. While you're while you've got that book and you're mulling through it, go to C. Look up connotative as opposed to denotative, and maybe we'll, we'll, we as will now start to move that you can have a non-literal meaning. You can have the dictionary definition. It might even say that there. Oh, uh, 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 it might even say it in the dictionary. Connotative. Not necessarily the prime meaning or dictionary definition. Whoa, can the wheel start moving now? But, you know, we are dealing with people who have been completely institutionalized in their thinking. You know, I've gone into this so much. So now I, now I just don't even bother with it. You know, I put my stuff in front of it and say, okay, you like it, you don't like it, you know. But one day you might find those connections within yourself, the why of it. You know, the famous how, why, where, when. When people start asking these questions become, and especially as we've said time and time again from the outset of the female Illuminati, symbol literacy. It's what we don't have, but what we should have. But our masters have it. This is the one the footprint that they've left because they are obsessed with it. Just like the atavistic, you know, atavistic uh, symbolism is like the next level on, uh, the most advanced level of symbol literacy. And we introduced that for the first time in this program. I mean, maybe we can talk about that later. But just the basic, again, symbol literacy, which I went into in Brotherhood of Death and other programs, that's their mistake, if you will. That's their leaving of the forensic evidence. The etymology is, is part of that. And once that keeps leading, so in the beginning when you asked, how did you discover this? It's through that method is one of the key things, just keeping that symbol literacy going, and then it moved and moved forward until you start extrapolating this more particular form of uh, obscene imagery and symbolism, which ha leads in a direction. This etymology leads somewhere, you know, and, uh, and, and, and the symbolism leads somewhere. Like I said, it ends with this atavism, and once you've cracked that, oh my God, the whole dirty, you know, sump of uh, the whole Pandora's box at that point is, is flung wide open and you get to see what's been going on on this planet. It's incredible. Oh yeah, it's true. And actually I had the honor of interviewing Jordan Maxwell last year and he was bringing up a really good point about symbolism. He said, look, if you come to LA and you're walking downtown or you're walking through the streets and you can't decipher the symbolism left by the gangs in that area, uh, you might find yourself in an area where you're not supposed to be because that's not your turf, that's their turf. And they've marked it using their symbolism. So you better become pretty symbol literate uh, in just from where you're going to be walking because you might be walking on someone's turf, right? Some of these gangs, they declare turf and they mark it up and they put symbols to mark it. Some of the symbols are physical symbols like throwing some shoes over a telephone wire or putting mm -hmm. spray paint of some kind of symbol here or there. They wear the jackets and the shirts. They're a little bit more overt about it, but we're dealing with the criminal mafia that runs the world that yeah. have been doing this for thousands of years. And there's also the ritual element. This is something that I found to be very key. And what really blew me away, speaking about ritual and symbolism, especially feminine symbolism, is when we track back and look at the sort of official Illuminati history, what we know, we talk about guys like um, Ignatius Leola. We talk about guys like Adam Weishaupt who were supposed to be Jesuits or operating for the Jesuit order. Um, and the Jesuit order has always been held, you know, historically as being something very powerful. Um, even Dulles, you know, the founder of the CIA was saying, you know, this is the most powerful intelligence network on the planet, etc. cetera. Um, but yet they're symbols and they're, they're, these guys are walking around in dresses. They're walking around using female symbols. So they're meant to be the big scary Illuminati, but they're using these very symbols that we're talking about. So getting symbol literature and understanding the big international gang signs is, is really yeah. what we're talking about, right? 
That is what it is all about. And the, uh, once you develop this uh, ability, you will then quickly discover the ambivalence of the symbols so that two gangs can even use the same symbol. Mm. Like those red and white dragons in the Arthurian legend, you know, or the five-toed dragon and the three-toed dragon, right? Uh, or the serpent. The serpent can be used by uh, good, positive groups, like we use the word sophic, and then the sophianics, you know, using the same symbol in a, in a more negative way. Mm. That helps as well. But see, one of the more interesting areas, uh, why we don't have the symbolic literacy, and they do, is because we are the victims of the ancestral trauma. So the freezing that happened to our minds and intelligence centers partly cut off this. Because remember those two quotes I started with, which showed that all the early teachings uh, were, were symbolic. I opened with these two quotes to show you. You know, and I could add hundreds of quotes to this, where they said that in the past, all learning was symbolic. Right, so then how come we are so symbol illiterate? That then leads you to another pathology, which is the shutting down of these centers. And that occurred through the trauma. So the man today, uh, needs not, he needs to become symbolically literate, but he also needs to uh, bring the past to the present so he can remedy this deeper ancestral trauma. You know, yeah, from the paroxysms of nature, that's, that's one level of the trauma, and I dealt with that in the Atlantis book. But now as we move forward, we see that there's also, you know, others. There was genetic manipulation of our being that caused a major trauma. And then there's this genocide now of the original aboriginal males. You see, so that wasn't something I dealt with before, but now I've come to believe from reading all the, and it was a sad thing we, in the female Illuminati, that's one thing we did have to leave out, is these incredible accounts from all over the world that talk about women creating the cataclysm. You know, this, basically the sisterhood, not, not women again of, in general, but this evil, evil sisterhood that, that uh, colluded with the Nephilim decided to wipe out the aboriginal men. So that is one of the uh, other instances that we've heavily suppressed. And a heavily suppressed person, heavily repressed mind is like a, a heavily drugged mind. It is a mind-controlled mind. It's auto-hypnotized. It, it's, a, it's a racial amnesia. And my God, the profoundness of that. Like I said, you know, that could be a 10-hour presentation right there. Yeah. I want us to skip over things, but th because there's evidence of this. I mean, just, you know, if you have the Emanuel Balakovsky's entire library, oh my God, do you have any idea of the incredible work that could be done extrapolating that man's thesis <laughs> from the first book he wrote to the last, which is all about ancestral trauma. Mostly he wrote about the causes of it, right? The, the paroxysms of what he thought was a comet. He didn't, you know, we disagreed, you know, because in my, it was, a, it was an orb and our solar system that got destroyed, i.e., time, matter, phaeton, whatever you want to call it. But uh, Velikovsky, a little bit like Commons Beaumont, a little bit like Zachariah Sitchin, believed it was a foreign body. You know, just, as, just as an aside here for people who are interested, because they might read my work to be a clash. Mm. They think it's a foreign body, i.e. Venus or phaeton, they have their own, and that came in like a billiard cue, you know, and just smashed in uh, and created devastation, higgledy-piggledy. That's why Uranus is on its side. That's why the moon is pocked. That's why Saturn has those rings. That's why that the uh, asteroid belt, you know, our, our solar system is in a state of chaos. Mm. And so every one of these teachers had a different uh, reason for it. Uh, and I have my own take on it, that it wasn't a foreign body invading. It was the explosion of a planet that used to be in our solar system. And that's what caused the creation of the moon, maybe of Venus, and then these other uh, features that these other planets have, these weird features. And that's why today people pray up and look up. The trauma has caused us to pray to God for safety, and when we do that, we look up because we're looking to heaven, right? The heavenly bodies, because it was the heavenly bodies that caused the original trauma, the original unearthing of the human psyche. And so now we don't look down. Hell is down, right? Danger is down. The, the, the creatures of the abyss are down. That's on earth, here in the, in the void. And we look up to say, oh, gods, don't do this again, you know, because the gods were considered planets in those days. You remember, I even had this anecdote where the sisterhood, and maybe not just the sisterhood, but other priest archies were using this fact for their own benefit. These, some of these cataclysms that happened later, or at least these celestial events, played into their hands to help galvanize their power. You know, that's a separate thing from what we're talking about. But ultimately, the, even the reason to look to heaven and to pray for order, to bring you back of order, and, and don't visit us again. And I'm not making this up because it's right there in the Bible where God says, yeah, I won't visit you again. The rainbow will be the symbol of my agreement with you to never bring any more cataclysms. Well, it's funny, history has been full of them, right? But anyway, <laughs> but, right, but the Bible, you know, how many tsunamis have we had? And yeah. God must have forgotten. He must be sort of, you know, uh, like an absent-minded professor. 
hundreds of millions of people have died in Bangladesh, go ask them there and tell them, that, you know, did you, did you know in the Christian Bible, God said they'd be visiting you with no more monsoons, typhoons, cyclones, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, all the other tidal, tidal waves and so on. Is that what it says? Jesus, it was real accurate too, you know? Yes. Okay. And there's also been this uh, feeling, I guess, it's, it's from the religious sort of tentacles that we've all been raised with and conditioned with, where we have to bow and, and have this sort of worshipful attitude towards something that is looked at in a hierarchical way. And this translated very easily for the elites of history. You know, it doesn't matter what culture you come from. If you can get people in that mindset where this God force is there and it's going to bring some kind of wrath down upon you if you don't worship in the right way or say the right mantra or walk and go and get water a certain way. It, it's, it's, a very, it's a very easy control structure. And it seems to be that religion and that uh, negative view of the divine spirit of the universe uh, especially embodied in a very particular way, that's been something that has also assisted in continuing this trauma. So we had the original traumas that took place, as you've pointed out, and fractured our consciousness. And then from there, it seems like these other people or beings sort of picked up and from there just said, oh yeah, keep going that way. Let's keep the trauma yeah. going. Let's keep everybody lined up, bowing their heads, following orders. Uh, let's fracture the language. Let's divide the nations. Let's get everybody at war. So that way from that chaos, we can create the order that we want, which is pretty much what it's always been uh, right up to today, right? Yeah, and that galvanizing force was the priests. They wanted to galvanize their force and then use this fact. They, they, they studied early on that man was in this comatose state. And, and so they're the ones who <coughs> exacerbated this problem by creating even more divisions. Like you say, second waves of trauma on top of the first. Well, they're still doing it today, by the way. The, the pulling of the rug with various everyday traumas about vaccination and mercury and fluoride and wars and rumors of wars and meltdowns financially. <coughs> this is all done to, again, unseat us on a psychological level because they know that if they can get down to the lower strata and unseat you, automatically the rest of the body politic is, is crippled. So they don't really need to go in on all the upper levels. That, that's been tried and it's not very successful. They, they've always used this more subtle Orwellian um, uh, or not even really Orwellian. Not, Orwellian is more the outer one. It's like this more Aldous Huxley motif of working within secretly. He, he warned about that because he knew all about it. Mm -hmm. So it's this more subtle aspect of working on the psyche. And uh, this is, has an ancient, ancient history. In fact, this reminds me that see in the, in the female Illuminati I was going to have a section on Julian James who I've wor worked on, uh, you know, used his message so many times before, used his work, but unfortunately it started to get so long that I just ended up just taking it out and trying to abbreviate it. But see, now that we're talking about it, he was the one who noticed, not, not so much what we're talking about, but there, that there was something in, in the more coming up to historical period, just before the historical period, something different about human consciousness. And then, you know, to try and unpack that and explain all of this in the female Illuminati when time was just kicking back, it was impossible to get into the depth of it. But in short, what he was really saying is that we didn't have the subjective sense of I-ness that we had in, in the later historical times. And this is backed up by even people like Eric Fromm, who said we didn't have a sense of I-ness right up until the Middle Ages. Hmm. You know, and that's also all debatable, of course, right? But Julian James is saying that 3,000 years BC, when he's focusing in, and yeah, he, he nods to the fact that it could have been terrestrial, you know, cataclysms of a celestial nature. He nods at all of this stuff. He doesn't really go into it, but he just assumes that something happened that uh, caused us to become more eye centered, where the headspace was completely different. And we now conceived of ourselves, had an image of ourselves as an eye. And he has the most wonderfully, elegantly written book that, again, was shelved and pushed aside by the mainstream. You know, he was from Stanford and they just totally didn't want to know. Because it, of course, it contradicted the, every brick in their wall of lies, didn't it? Mm. So he then uh, went into this, and that's what fascinated me, that he was talking about these subsequent moments of trauma. So I think that uh, it's not that he got something wrong, necessarily. It's just that what had happened is that 8, 10, 13,000 years ago, there was an initial massive trauma, right, followed on by the other ones that I focus on. And then as we move up, it didn't just stop. It didn't even heal. There was other ones that just like a domino effect kept happening. Because our Earth was also, if you, if you read my Irish Origins book, I mentioned all these other cataclysms and tsunamis that happened down through the ages, right? Like especially the one, the, the, the volcano 
at Mount Thera and the famine in Egypt and all. So even the earth was continuing to have these uh, paroxysms. I'm assuming the mind did as well, and Julian James is a very good uh, one to read because he seems to agree because he focuses on this one period in which something massive happened. And why I'm going into this right now is because it ties in with the priests because the one thing he does admit is that the priests took full advantage of this. In fact, they were mainly the orchestrators of it. So he's, he's, uh, he is of the opinion that the God idea is what is left of this ancestral consciousness, you know, the one that we've changed and we became more ego-centered, more subjective, uh, that, that, that cut us off from the world, cut us off from nature. But it also the vestiges of that ancient voice is, are gods and angels and, so, and all the rest of it. And then he talks about the priests taking over, and, and actually has an interesting thing even about priest S's. So his, my work actually comes quite close at one point because he's starting to talk about omens, superstitions, divination, which was more in the hands of the female more than it was in the hands of the priests. So the rise of the witches, the rise of these uh, exploitatory women who were starting to, uh, like in the Hittites. I mean, it's just historical fact that the Hittite empire fell when two queens were ruling and they were at each other's throats with all sorts of black magic and evil. You see, so James is, is taking that prior and saying that in his opinion, the Atlantean world or the world of our prehistory was compromised by priests and priestesses who were, you know, now rattling their, you know, their beads and, and uh, doing all sorts of the more familiar stuff that we know that they did, which is omens, superstitions. There's an incredible uh, Doctor Who from the 70s, a program called The Mask of Mandragora, which just unpacks this. So if people go to YouTube and put in The Mask of the Mandragora, Doctor Who, hopefully they'll get to see that. Um, and it's entirely about how a class of astrologers use astrology and use divination to basically mind control and a king, the, the king who's a bit ignorant and susceptible to this and just wants power, but he's manipulatable by these dark figures behind the throne. It's exactly what uh, Jalen James is saying. Um, it's exactly what the historians of the Hittite, this great, great rival empire to the Egyptians, they'd always been fighting each other, you see, but suddenly this empire falls and they know how it fell. And so there's a tremendous story there about uh, the role of this sisterhood, let's say, that this gynocracy, right across the board. What they've done is they've shifted the gears, shifted the mirrors, so that you focus on the rise of these so-called uh, sword-wielding Aryan, they call them Indo-European horseback riding maniacs, who came and wiped out all of, all of these, uh, you know, uh, Amazons and all of these matriarchies. But that's, that's been contradicted. My, my point is, even if it happened, what caused it? You, nobody's, the feminists don't tell you what caused All of a sudden, everybody go, get up, go to the fridge, no beer, right, go kill. Yeah. All over the earth? It doesn't make sense. At exactly the same time, you bet it doesn't make sense. It's nonsense, right? But then, getting back to the point, they've shifted the mirror so that you do see and focus on that, but you don't focus on equal evidence for the rise of these sisterhoods all throughout the world. Who were doing the same thing but the evidence is there for that it's in the old testament it's in many of the apocryphal legends it's in all of the legends of the world right remember that quote i i actually should have used it more but i have it about twice in the female illuminati and it's about that dogon myth where a, a, a woman discovers what they call the skirt of the earth mother and it's stained in blood hmm. and she wears it and gains universal power and in the end the men got to come in and steal the thing away and bury it or burn it because to get the power out of the hands of the woman, right? Of course, we know how feminists would uh, interpret that, but she'd interpret the part where the man go steal the skirt, not that the woman abused the power when she got the skirt. Hmm. It's, only, it's only a couple of lines, mate, but they're going to focus on the last part and not the first, and that's what they've been doing historically, right? Yeah. Now, when I used that quote, I was just focusing on the fact that it was a symbol of the menstrual blood that even the earth mother bleeds, and that's the aprons that the masons wear. You know, I was tying in that kind of thing. But it dawned on me later that, no, wait a minute, in that Dogon myth, you've got the whole story right there. That the earth female, so to speak, found a divine thing, found a thing of the earth mother, and, and abused it. That's the two sisterhoods. The original Sophics had the, had the love of the earth mother. They were communing with the earth mother. They may have used even you know hallucinogenics to do that, but there was nothing negative in that at all. Mm. Uh, another group, right, the younger female, came and, and with, you know, avarice, with the... Uh, personal uh, ambition, this is the sisterhood, you see, take the skirt. So as I said, they wrote in metaphor, they wrote an allegory, and she used it to just devastate, used the power that wasn't hers to devastate until the, and the men were the victims, so the men went and took the skirt, you know, and there's hundreds and hundreds of legends like this. 
uh, about this kind of abuse that again the feminists do not want to know they don't want to go up to tell you what caused the rise of the of these uh malignant patriarchy their their reasons for it are extremely shallow and, and wrong-headed even if you get uh, some of them are so you know fervent they don't even offer and it, it just happened like i say it just happened if we're in a court of law that is not good enough it just happened yes you know and they won't come down to the other level to say to accept that women have a criminal history now you don't need to be a misogynist, you see, to tell you tell people that women have a criminal history. Anthropologists know all about it. Prostitution, one of the earliest, um, what do they call it? The earliest profession, sort of half yeah. jokingly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, prostitution is a legal and moral crime. Prostitution was is not written in any scripture. That's immoral against the eyes of God. Yet it's something that women have done throughout the years. The prostitution we dealt with in the female Illuminati is the higher ritual vestal virgin aristocratic type, which had a whole other theological, it, it, in my eyes it's just as criminal, but it's it's different in the context we're talking now. That's a very religious, holy, spiritual, right? the sacerdotal female administering her potions, offering sex, no money involved. At some point in history, other women, right? decided, hey, that's good, but we can charge money for it, a much later phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. And that became what we know to be prostitution. Behind that is a more sacerdotal version that we covered extensively in the, in the program. But then the, the prostitution, more familiar to everyone, is a sort of a stripped-down version of that where money is not being charged. But the crime, and I'm not, this is not me saying this, this is well-known anthropologist and criminal, criminalists, criminologist saying this, that because man now had to pay for what he needed sexually, he start committing the other welter of crimes that we now know uh, today, right? In order to pay for the prostitution. So right there, women are at the center of historical crime. I didn't write this, I didn't invent it, it's a fact. Once they saw that this was taking place, they could have packed up and said, oh, well, we, gotta, we gotta change this because look at all the theft that's taking place, even the murders, the men are cudgeling people in the alleyways and breaking into houses, you see? No, they didn't stop, it, it got worse. And so, a, a sane woman, a sane man knows that, look, the licentiousness of history, the infidelity, the incest, you know, the, the hypocrisy, the duplicity, the manipulation, the murders, the, the, the incarcerations, the luring, the bewitching, right? The infanticide, the patricide, the regicide. How can you lay all of that only at the door of the male? Anyone who's even done five minutes of homework and is an open-minded person knows that all of those crimes and more are, are antique. They've been going on from the dawn of time, even embezzling and what have you. Yeah, and women are right in there with it. In the American secret, in the secret history of America, do you know how important, it's another, another area that people need to investigate, is the role of women in the undermining of America. Behind all the Alexander Hamiltons and Galatines and Aaron Burrs, and this other Belmont, August Belmont, and, and the Livingstone family, and all, all I could just go on and on naming you these uh, murderous families who undermined the sovereignty of America, you know, working for the crown of England. The women were central in that. Tudors, funders, uh, co-conspirators. Do we know anything about, can you name me one of those people? But no, but you can mention, you can mention the men, the men involved in this, you know, uh, you know, Easily. Did you know that you know, heads of the Illuminati, like uh, Giuseppe Mazzini, used to, his, his, one of his closest colleagues, the, one, the, the woman he stayed with in London, you know, was, was uh, Thomas Carlyle's uh, wife. You know, they, they were completely in collusion. So you have, you've heard of, everyone's heard about Thomas Carlyle, and everybody's heard about Giuseppe Mazzini. But have they heard about you know, the woman with whom he stayed when he was there in her mansions or any of the other anecdotes I could go into, you see? Hmm. So this editing, this, this incredible editing that we've done with history, even modern history, and let alone ancient history, is, is the result of what? The trauma. When you repress something, right, like the original one being the aboriginal destruction, once you cannot face that, then automatically you're skewed in your vision. And then other crimes that women have done down through the centuries also get uh, minimized, negated, or, oh, well, there's another source to that. And again, it's like, you know, uh, uh, the justice is, is uh, slapped in the face, and we have mitigation, 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 mitigation. Now, all I've done is, I say, when you sweep away some of this mitigation, it's like, you know, a lawyer taking out the whole dusty brief, and over, and, you know, like they have to do with any kind of uh, cold case, and you start looking it over it again, and you say, well, let's get rid of the mitigation, just, just park it, just bracket it for a minute. 
incredible, incredible things happen. And do you know what happens? The myths of the world come back and go, told you so. Where have you been, modern man? What, what are you thinking? Don't you know that 90%, 95% of your own history is prehistoric? You're living in a bubble of modernity. Your own history, the human race, the hominid, whatever you want to call it, the, the majority of that history is prehistoric. What do you know about prehistoric? The moment somebody talked to you about wars of gods and uh, rise and fall of Atlantis or hundreds of other continents, you laugh and, and leave the room. Yeah. Or more likely you pillory that person who's trying, how dare you? What do you know about it? You, 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 you've just been watching soccer games and just big screen TVs and you don't even know that everything you, know, you are involved in is built on a giant pyramid of the past. And most of that past is prehistoric. So the less you know, so even when a Freud start talking about, you know, the top, uh, the, the, you know, uh, totem and taboo, uh, the prehistoric setup. I cover this in, uh, I think, even two, three chapters actually in the volume two of the Irish Origins. I find it so important. Again, when you strip away what people have said and you just look at what this man was saying about the primal tribe situation where the sons conspire to kill the father, the regicide, right? All of this fascinating stuff, Emmanuel Valakowski, you wouldn't even need to go, it's A to Z. You can throw in Julian James if you want, but just, I mean, if you just go to Emmanuel Valakowski's work from A to Z, you will have a picture of the past. You know, and I love, I think even even in many ways equally as strong, especially for people living in Britain, is Cummins Beaumont, my, my great hero, right? So, you know, the, the, I mean, it doesn't take much though, because a lot of the other books that have been written in our 20th, you know, in the last 10, 20 years, are basically recapitulations and reiterations of these earlier guys, just in more modern language. But the purist says, I want to pick up Riddle of Ancient Britain. I want to pick up uh, Worlds in Collision or Ages in Chaos. You know, I did. Before I wrote my Atlantis book, I had been reading all that. That's what inspired my work, right from Point Go. Or the great Ignatius Donnelly. And, you know, but it's only a handful of people we're talking about. But they offer you such an archive of knowledge that then your job becomes easier. You can find within them so many other threads, you know, that you can then follow on your own. So it's not like, oh my God, I got to listen to this guy's rant, you know. No, he's talking about the heavens, the cataclysms, the, 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 the dynamics of the priests manipulating the human race, the ancestral trauma. It's all there. And it's, it's right for us to take it apart and reconfigure it again in a way that, you know, makes sense to what we now know because those guys lived, you know, several decades ago, and there's been lots of progress. So we can take what they were, and it's our duty to do that, to take the great work of these men with whom we could never know anything about our times. These are the greats, the giants, but we need to renovate and upgrade their work and not just leave it there, you know, to, to gather dust. That, that's, that's crucial in my eyes. Oh, absolutely. We, as you said before, we stand on the shoulders of giants. We, we are here in this time bringing together what we've been able to discover through modern research. I mean, there's been new discoveries happening now on a regular basis. It's something yeah. you even predicted in your uh, Atlantis work was that this was going to be an age where we were going to get so far down the road in terms of unraveling our past. And and as you keep bringing up trauma, trauma is something that you can't run from. It's something you must face. I know that from just experiencing the, the little traumas I've had to go through in my life that if I had left them in the back door or the back closet somewhere and never really fully addressed them head on, I wouldn't be operating in a, in a pure, full, fully cognitive way. I would be constantly hampered by that. So it's as if the whole human race is hampered by these various traumas. It, it, the man, you know, mankind has their, uh, or sorry, men would have their trauma that they have to deal with and uh, account for their history, their criminal history. Uh, as well as women, it's this. I mean, the human race in general has suffered, you know, in different ways because of these various traumas and because of these external influences. Um, and you also bring up this concept of, uh, you know, consorting with the Nephilim. You know, to, you're actually consorting with the beings that came here to, uh, you know, basically take over and initialize their agenda and using the human race as their fodder, right? And so if we have people that are consorting there. And to kind of almost sell out their own kind, uh, that's, that's probably, I don't know how much more criminal you can get, you know, when you really yeah. analyze it. That's right. And that's why even today, you know, see people think, oh, this is all ancient history. The word female that is used every single day in our world means evil male. Fey, right, means evil. F-E-Y or F-A-Y. And mal, male, is the male. So the very word we use for women, female, means evil one, evil male. Hmm. 
right? Well, it's so, so, we, we, so we are carrying it in the interstitial moments of our life, the symbolism, what we do unconsciously, that's why I said it's repressed. So when we talk, oh, that female, we're going, that evil one. I mean, we don't even realize, and women don't realize it either. So it, it's, in, it's in, like you said, it's indelible, like a tattoo. It's, it's like in our DNA. It's in our racial memory. We operate by forgetting it and then forgetting that we forgot about it. Now, I, I, I know that this is uh, disastrous because all my interest in ancient history is born out of my interest in modern age. The control mechanisms, like we talked about in Brotherhood of Death and others, this hidden hand uh, of you know, elites know this. I mean, one just, you know, could say it to the end of their days, they know this. So they only know that they've got to just remind you, and they can do this subliminally through media, through advertisements, through all sorts of other uh, subliminal means. The moment that they start working on that raw nerve that lies at the base, it's like the rotten tooth, it's like the house of cards. The moment that they challenge that, everybody falls into draconian line. Everybody will march off like robots to kill whoever they say the enemy is. And they have just, then the rest of it is a game for them. It's like, what, what game should we play today? Mm -hmm. When we've got the formula, you take it, you be white, I'll be black. And then the game of world politics, that grand chessboard, and you have various people down through history, like we said, Lord Balfour, one minute, it's Zbigniew Brzezinski, the next minute. These are just guys who, you know, like, oh, I'm chucking the towel in. Can you take over for me? Like in a game of cards, a game of poker. <laughs> I'm tired. And so another Johnny with a cigar smoke blowing in your eyes comes along to blow smoke in the eyes of the human race. It's just one, and they're trained to do this. They have their own colleges to say, you know, join the game, mate. It's called the Great Game. Did you know that? In MI5, in, secret, in, the, in the British Secret Service, the uh, geopolitical uh, machinations are actually called the game. I'm not making this up. They actually call it the Great Game. You can, you, they whistleblow this in a movie called, uh, it's actually quite hard to find, it's called a Kim, K-I-M, based on the work of Rudolf, uh, based on the work of uh, Rudyard Kipling, the Mason. Kipling was a Freemason who spent a lot of time in India, so he wrote these wonderful rambling stories, you know, uh, fictional, apparently <laughs> fictional, right? Hmm. Uh, yeah, and another one that, if you want to watch Kim then with Errol Flynn, watch back, right beside it, watch uh, this other movie, The Man Who Would Be King. Oh, okay, with, yeah. With Sean Connery. Sean Watch them back to back because they're about Masons. Yeah. And they're about India specifically. And, de and you don't even have to decode it. It's so bloody obvious, right? And in it, when the secret intelligence a British agent in Kim, he's, he, uh, he uh, spots Kim. They start using him because, and they train him for years into uh, what they're doing. And they call it the great game. So I'm not making this up. And Roger, Rudyard Kipling, many of these people who work for these British institutions, you know, but they were uh, able to visit, you know, they were part of the British East India Company and other important imperial orgs. On their off days, while they're riding in the train, you know, or sunning themselves at the cricket match, you know, this kind of caper, they'd write this shit down and then make it into a fictional thing, and then it got published. And the whole of British British public used to read it. You know, this was the empire at the time, British Empire. And so all of this stuff, would come, and it's filled with the, the information that we're talking about. You can just extrapolate from just even fiction. Now, if I, even Enid Blyton, for God's sake, you know, her, her, her family worked for British intelligence. We have uh, Dennis Wheatley. We have the famous case of uh, Ian Fleming. You know, but there's many, many other an author there who was blowing the whistle and talking about these things, like the writer Haggards and what have you. And uh, either they had a stint in the military or their fathers did. Or they were just men of incredible genius, you see, who were in some sort of uh, subliminal, subtextual way telling you these great, great stories. What did we do? It's trauma again. Oh, it's just fiction. I don't want to face it. That might have actually happened. Okay. Tolkien, you know, C.S. Lewis, George MacDonald. You're going to just write it all off as fiction. And then you find out that these men were towering figures in the church, towering figures in, in intellectual Circles, geniuses beyond geniuses. They're just going to be like Lewis Carroll, or, you know, the guy, right? Alice in Wonderland. Have you any idea, you know, how to unpack that? What, what, what's hiding behind that apparent nonsense? Because they knew that if you write it too literally, even if they don't suppress it at your time, after you're gone, your book may be, you know, thrown into the fire, so to speak, by those who come later. So they knew that to cloak it, cloak it, cloak it, cloak it, so that it will last the test of time. This is the same thing with Patrick McGowan. 
This is the same thing with so many others I could mention, you see, who've made masterpieces that teach us. They've done it under the guise of fiction, and that's just purely a method of sustaining and, and getting past the censors of those cigar smoking guys who go, I don't understand all this shit. What's it all about? Go ahead. Is it making money? Good. And it gets then to us. Yeah. Because they can't, they themselves are so, you know, there's, there's tears, there's hierarchies. Some of these guys just let it pass because they just are so brute. They can't understand what all this, is this art or something? Right. So it gets passed. And then you're left with these wonderful stories by Edgar Allan Poe and even by uh, uh, H.P. Lovecraft. Right. And what about the guy that wrote the Conan the Barbarian, you know, Howard Smith, mm. the Conan the Barbarian stories, you know, and, and Alice in Wonderland and all of that. Red Sonia and all these. Red Sonia, come on. I mean, how, you don't even need to decode that goddamn film. It's yeah. right there. And many of these other ones, the Doctor Who's, the Blake Sevens. You know, so I, I tried to open in the female Illuminati by suggesting some of this so that the right brain is activated too. Because remember, this is ancestral after all. Hmm. Uh, so we need other things. And do you remember, that's why periodically, by the way, they happen in the 70s with all those Charlton Heston disaster movies. Then it happened again, sort of uh, coming up to the millennia, the new millennia, where you had one the day after tomorrow. You know, destruction, aliens, they even made that crazy, stupid-ass film, uh, war, war, World War of the Gods, war or whatever it was. War of the Worlds and war of the world. Day yeah. and all these films. Yeah. All that, again, because this is this is part of this touching of that chord. Hey, make sure, oh, they're getting a bit, bit sleepy in the wrong way. Hey, Cameron, hmm. get out there, right? So Avatar, so like you say, Abyss, the Abyss. If you can even watch that horrible movie, you know, but again, decode it. Look at these things and a way to decode it. Wow. What does the water symbolize? What are the beings in the water symbolize? You know, the whole thing is loaded with occult symbolism that actually happened here. Deluged through water. In our deepest brain is the idea of water being shit, scared the shit out of you and, and the creatures in the water. Mm. We have, uh, what's that? Solaris, that amazing movie. It was remade. Uh, you can either watch the original or even the latter. The one is so good. Solaris, a planet of water that has this, it's like a brain. And when you go near it, it changes your dream state. It changes you as you are. An ama amazing movie that works on many levels, Freudian, Jungian. But it also is based in the idea that our planet once was like this. It was laid waste. And the planet itself then becomes a, a metaphor, a double metaphor for not only the actual physical destruction, but the new race who came, who's, who, who have got a split consciousness. But in the movie Solaris, you're really being regressed. And there's the woman again, the, the symbol of the female who turns up hmm. as a sort of a ghostly, atavistic memory and affects the characters or character or, or in the movie. And then he's slowly regressing out of the ego. I mean, that's almost gone as soon as he lands, actually. And then he's into the whole nebulous world of the pre-conscious, hallucinogenic sort of real psychedelic stuff where, you know, the planet's talking to him. And uh, is partly good and partly bad, and he doesn't know if he's if, he, if he's being pulled apart, or there's another kind of you know coalescence of his consciousness. Yeah, well, that's the that's the, we all have to go through this because we don't know. And for some people, the, the moving into the unconscious is purely disastrous, purely something they want to resist. Mm. And for others uh, who take a more of a Blakean you know aspect, they go, oh no no, there is a layer of trauma, but behind that there's something even greater, and I've got to make that underworld journey. I've got to go through the realm of ruins. If you watch the end of uh, Orpheus, uh, Orphe, uh, the French movie by Jean Cocteau, and uh, know how to decode that movie. You've got the presence of the female. The, that movie is monumentally important. And then you see them in the end, they're going through what appears to be, they move through a mirror, actually. It's one of the first movies that actually had this motif of moving through a mirror and then going into the other world and then negotiating the ruins and the kind of weird sort of surrealistic Alice in Wonderland type of environment in order to get to the secret of what's really going on, a greater sense of wholeness. But that sense of wholeness then requires the total uh, denial of everything that has been known before. Because we've been living in a world of mirrors in which truth is a lie. You know, the mirror has been, and the mirror movers have been moving things as you walk. It's like a predator who knows how to change its scent. You know, it's like uh, one minute it's standing on two legs, next it's on four legs, next it just disappears and flies away. The predator is able to change its form, it's chameleon-like, and therefore it's very, very hard to follow. And it's the same with our minds. Our minds have got many halls, many mansions, many of them in total ruins. And so it takes a great deal of uh, power, you know, like the hermit in the tarot card, there he is with his lantern, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, but in that light of that lantern, you might not just see beautiful pastures and wonderful utopias laid out. You, know, you might see 
ruins of unimaginable horror stretching to the horizon. You may see, like what C.S. Lewis pointed out in his magician's nephew, you know, the devastation of entire worlds. And there's the female again. You know, so when people dig into this, they're going to see patterns. And it's like you said at the beginning, it's the same motifs, maybe slightly tweaked, but over and over against the same motifs. We are the ones who are editing. We're the ones who are not connecting the dots. We're the ones who got the beads all over the table without a thread. So the time in our, my belief is that the time has come to put them together. And I say, I know a lot of people don't like it. It's painful. They rather go and, you know, search for their soulmate or something, you know, but, but, the, but this is important. This is holy work because this is the world that you're leaving to your children. Do you want to leave them a realm of ruins, a world of ruins and, and unintelligible chaos, which is what's happening? Or do you want to give your children the golden thread? You know, you don't cut it up too small for them, but you at least give them the tools to say, there's no mystery that the mind of man cannot create that it cannot solve. You know, it's like Mr. Spock, there are always possibilities. Never say die. If, if we got into this situation, we can get out of it. And this it goes for even the bigger, bigger levels. Even though the job may be painful and you've got to burn down a lot of sacred cows on the way, you know, it's still, uh, it's still a very, very important. And it's just each of us, I have my own way of doing that with the scholars I read and touch on. And then another person will have a completely different way of coming to the same conclusions. I've had people tell me that, the, you know, in their work with the human body, um, they, they've encountered an equivalent of what I'm saying. There's people who've studied DNA, like Bruce Lipton. Hmm. There's people who've studied the brain. You know, you've, I think if you, you had him on, on your show. I haven't had Bruce Lipton on, but he's definitely on my list. I've been trying to get a hold of him because that, that kind of information about looking about what the cells are actually doing and, yeah. and that whole idea of our consciousness connection to the cells, how we can literally manifest change through our thought yeah. process. I mean, that's who's getting told that in school today? Yeah, and Greg Braden. Yeah. You know, it's like soil levels. Yeah. In, in, in everywhere you look, you're going to find the same archetype. In physical life or in mental life, in psychic life or spiritual life, you will find a strata of the catastrophe. You know, this weird strata where things don't make sense. It's there in our consciousness, like Jean Cocteau was showing. And then above it is all this other cacophony. You know, in the beginning of the film, he has the, the main poet, the hero of the, of the film, sitting in a square, in, in a, uh, sitting in a, in a town square with all the noise of the so-called poets, the musicians and the young people just going crazy. And it's the intellectual, it's just like at any coffee house where there is this intellectual banter. But he was showing that, that that's the mind, that's the superficial aspects of the mind, the young people running around and talking politics and talking poetry and uh, screaming and yelling at each other and ordering food and, and getting all passionate. It's the city square he's using it. It's been the ancient, ancient medieval symbol of the world, the chaos outside of the, you know, where the priests are observing from on high, you know. So he has this wonderful uh, scene, which is the modern mind, the frontal lobes. And people are caught in that eternally until in one person's life, a trauma happens. And in this story, Orfe, it's a guy gets knocked down in the town square while they're all busy with a the thing. There's an accident happens. See, there's the trauma element that Takto is trying to draw attention to. And that trauma changes this person, the poet, the real poet. His life just changes at that moment. He runs to help and he gets caught into the whole fiasco. But that's the point that until a trauma happens in your life, is what the filmmaker is saying, you carry on with this cacophony. You carry on with this argy-bargy, you see, in the superficial, which we're all doing. Until something comes along where you lose a family member, you lose all your money, you lost your job, you were undercut by somebody else, you went through disease or great ill health, you know, or, or some other thing that made you contemplative mm. came about. And just as the poet stands up, I it's been a lot since I've seen it, but when the, the poet hero stands up and is about to leave, just as about to leave, he asks this other guy he's talking to, an older man, says, well, what, do you want, what do you want from me? What do you want me to do? And the guy goes, astonish us. You know, or probably it's not even a good translation, but it's more like amaze us. So what the, what the mass mind is saying is to the genius, you stay here with us. You know, our pages are blank. You know, he shows him a book with blank pages, really surrealistic kind of movie anyway. But he's showing us that we don't have anything of our own. You, mate, you're Orpheus, you're Dionysus, right? You're Apollo, you're Adonis, you're God, you're the child lover, you're, you're, you're the muse. You astonish us, so keep bring your genius to us. Don't go off into the other realms, don't go into the personal world. You see, and then the movie unfolds from that point, once you know what you're looking at. Wow. It's just unbelievable, you know, and he's made other films, of course, that go, go equally as deep, and there's many others besides. So all through this world literature, all through this, uh, you know, but if you, if you want the story written where it's understandable and not concealed, 
then you know you can turn to your Beaumonts and turn to your Velikovskys. I've tried to condense, you know, their work. And so in the female Illuminati, I made sure that there's a uh, part of the reason why it's so long is because there's lots of quotes, as you well know. And that's just simply because I don't want people coming away thinking he just made this up. Yeah. If I say one line, I'll have two lines from a great scholar, a great feminist writer, an anthropologist, you know, uh, uh, to back it up. Because I've done my homework. I know what I'm talking about. And this is not speculation. This is a deep, lifelong analysis of the ancient myths and legends of my country and others as well. And then I put the stuff together in this particular mandala. It doesn't mean everybody's got to sign on for it, but you know, I know what I'm doing. I've, this this makes sense to me. This makes this makes me, you know, have a level of of enlightenment when it comes to these matters. I it makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a that's a picture. It still needs constant, you know, fixing and changing. But generally speaking, it makes sense to me. And and when I find new pieces, I now know where to slot them. And you can also add that to the other volumes of work that you've done. And when you put all of those together, you can really go down a, a mm -hmm. lifelong journey of trying to analyze our history. And, and, and you've said it before as well, Michael, and we've spoken about this in other shows, about how important it is to analyze our history so that we can get a fix on what's happening in the world now. A lot of people look around at what's happening in the world now and they're totally confused and there's nothing but debate and argument and it's just, it's as if the fight over what is happening and how it's happening and who's doing what to whom is absorbing all of our energy instead of actually putting an end to it. So if we can go back and assess the trauma and work at healing that trauma, and it, it only can happen on an individual level first, then maybe we can start getting a better fix and a better handle on what's actually taking place in the world today and how we can change the direction so that we're heading in a more positive future, right? Yeah, exactly. It has to be individualistic because you are an individual. Like we said, you know, in another show, you have an internal part of yourself and you have this external participation in the world of other people. So you may notice the problem only when it manifests outside. There's nothing wrong with that. It seems that the whole human race is a bunch of worker ants. They're just on their knees. Now, that might be something you didn't notice about yourself, but you did notice it when you scan political history or world history, these oligarchs, you know, whatever way you want to express it. And you see that man is just this blind, dumb animal, mindlessly working, not for his own benefit, the thousands of hours that he slaves, the thousands of dollars that he makes, and he doesn't see the benefit of it either in leisure time necessarily or in, in, in capital, right? But then it turns around and goes, well, I saw that on the canvas of the world, but that's me individually. I'm the worker and I'm the one on my knees. I'm the one who's enslaving myself and I'm the one who's also being enslaved. So you may, it may be that you saw the problem externally, but then one day you wake up with a sweat and you say, oh my God, what am I talking about? I'm the one who's doing this. I'm participating. So how can you walk around slashing the, the uh, chains that enslave others if you're still tied up? Hmm. You know that, that quote in the Bible, don't try to fix the sight of somebody else until you remove the being from your own eye, right? That's what this process is all about. Once you are the person who can see, once you, like, the, you know, that they live, hmm. put the bloody glasses on. Well, the fight scene and that goes on for hours, <laughs> <It is. laughs> right? because it, that, that is the big problem of our world. Yeah. How do I get this idiot to put these fucking glasses on, right? Well, you're going to have to beat him to death. And, and in a way, that's what we're doing. You need to completely keep, you know, every time they turn on the screen, there you are. And they go, Kassarin, go away, go away, right? We do not want to know. Every, and, you know, I'm just going to go, no, I'll be turning up in your nightmares, right? There I am again. <laughs> pieces. You have to just, you know, it's like, knock, 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 the pest, you know? Yeah. He's back, shit. It's like Columbo, you know? Uh, one more question. One more point. But what can you do? I'm not going to let you sleep. I'll be throwing pebbles at your window from night till doomsday until you come out and get with this gig and raise the torch of freedom, true freedom, not, not the pseudo freedom, not the freedom from freedom, you know, all these other things that historically have been offered to us. And we go, great, great, you know, sign on for that. And we'll, we'll always have that because the masters are masters. They know how to direct traffic. They know what we want. But somebody's going to have to be there to say, no, uh, you know, the guy who's directing the traffic, why are you believing him when he's directing you to the edge of an abyss? It's like these guys with the dictionaries you're talking about. I've read their dictionaries, the ones who control us all, and they don't agree with you. What do you say to that? What the, you've, okay, you know, well, you can say, well, I'll tell you what, let's go to men whose brains were like a dictionary. Mm. Don't listen to me. Yeah. But have you heard of Gerald Massey? Have you heard of Alvin Boyd Kuhn? Have you heard of, you know, Albert Churchward? They, they can write the dictionary in their sleep. Could you admit then that they might have something to say that your little 
dictionary under your arm, you know, your little safety, you know, blanket there. They can decode that. They can show you the hidden meaning of words, the yeah. connotative meanings of words, what the elite who wrote those words are playing with. Somebody came up with that word, Genesis or Hebrew. And they, they, the people who came up with those words aren't particularly good people. They're disingenuous people who've not only played with words, they've played with the whole of civilization. The Bible has been torn apart and put back together again. I can't think how many times. By overlords, by occultists, by sorcerers, right? It would demonstrably be proven, for God's sake. Even I don't need to tell you. Insiders from the seminaries are now telling this is the case. Yeah. So how the hell are you going to a dictionary and say, look, look, look. And then what we've done, we've just gone to a town with that by showing that every symbol that exists in your consciousness that you've learned from Sunday school, from the assembly hall, about the Ark of the Covenant, all of it is female. David dances around it. David, the King, king David dances around the Ark of the Covenant. What does dance represent? Who dances? <laughs> Masons are born again, twice born. Who gives birth? <laughs> Masons wear aprons and are called widow's sons. And on and on and on it goes, right? I just don't know, you know, but see, this is about sticking people's heads in it until finally they, they realize this is this is important. I'm not worried about the, uh, you know, pain and suffering involved in that process because we're at the early stages yet of not only the healing, but of introducing new ideas. Whenever you're dealing with a traumatized victim, you can't even introduce one new idea. That's right. Without major spoon feeding and without major, you know, sugar coating of it, right? So we are in the early stages in this movement we would call conspiracy movement or alternative research movement. So all the voices, all the bullshit, all the little sodden rats that crawl out to, you know, defame and, and scoff. That's just that's just what you expect. We are in the, such the early stages of taking off this uh, lid, you know, and, and becoming aware. Now, Alex Jones has to have one bullhorn after the other. Of course he does. Of course he does, because there's resistance. Hmm. So he has his way all right, of bashing it into your head. I've got mine, and it's very frustrating. But we are in the early stages of, of, of even uh, you know, in, coming out of this nursery infantile level where we can get to grips with some of this. And the strange thing is that unless you're an authority figure, see, this is how the mind works. I won't accept what you're saying. Michael, where's your PhD? You need to be wearing a suit and tie. You need to have your hair short. You need to be standing on a, on a, a you know, where's your, where's, where's the university behind you? Where's all that shit? I won't believe you talking about anti-authority unless you're an authority figure. Exactly. <laughs> it's so true how programmed, how programmed yeah. we are. There's no PhD on your book that I can find. Where's yeah. your credentials? I'm not listening to the content. I'm wondering about the messenger. I don't like your photograph. You've got missing teeth. What's that gold cap doing? What's that earring doing? What's that tattoo doing? Right? I go, uh, forget, forget that. Just read the shit, right? No, yeah. no, no, no. You are not an authority, so I'm not going to listen to anything you say against authority. That's Stockholm syndrome, pal. Yeah. That is that's that's Stockholm syndrome, right? That is total institutionalization. But I'm glad to say, see that so many people in the world are not infected that badly. They may not have had any of the pieces yet, but they are receptive and they know they've been had. And quietly, without any you know noise, without any hoopla's, without any waving of arms and placards. You know, they come to me, support my work, and read it and check it out. And uh, you know, and uh, there's times when those numbers are small, and there's times when it's, it's, it's bigger, or whatever. That, that's that's all because they said train ten, they train a hundred, that hundred train, you know, a thousand, and then ten thousand. That's what I've always believed and said from the start. Uh, you have to be receptive to come to the work. I can't go to you. You know, uh, I'll do a bit of that by putting out what I've done. And, but it's then the person to sit down and, and do it. And that's been my philosophy from the start. That's why I made these much longer, you know, uh, pieces instead of chopping it up into sound bites. We did a little bit of that with Architects Control because, again, I don't mind meeting people halfway. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of, of my work, like you just saw with the female Illuminati, is much more meditative, drawn out, you know, lengthy. Because I'm putting something there that's very rich and very deep and, and isn't just going to be, you know, garnered in a year or, you know, this will be talked about and, and looked at. And, and unpacked again, time and time again, as we go. Because this EU is, is moving, you know, towards total globalization and total, you know, this dystopia. And then, that, so that's the future, future we've got to worry about, about what were our kids, this post-human nightmare. Then we've got the ancient, we've got to untie that Gordian knot. See, we can't fix today without untying the knot of the past. Mm -hmm. The knot exists in the past, so there's this whole weird atavistic thing that has to go on. What the women did in the past, this gynocracy, is a crime. All crimes 
are criminal and they need to be brought to justice, need to be brought to light. And all crimes have a motive. So my job was to look into not just that the crime had happened, but what was the motive? Was it sexuality? You see, and, and one of the things that we need to continue studying down through the years is whether it really was a sexual interest that existed between the Nephilim and the women. This, this is open to debate. The books kind of hint at it. So we go along with that, saying, yeah, you know, the sons of God wanted to mate with them. So there appear, appears to be a sexual connotation. But actually, that's in brackets. We didn't, I didn't go into this because, again, it would have taken off in a, in a digression. But as a matter of fact, there's a question whether early earth women were as sexual as they were later, whether their entire sexual uh, chemistry you know, and, and piping was even the same. This is oh, it's all fact, by the way. And whether uh, and, and there's evidence to show that it wasn't uh, the same. And that even men who wanted, to, even ordinary earth men who wanted to have sexual congress with a woman had to jump through enormous hoops because sex meant death for most women. Hmm. Childbearing. Childbearing, yeah. Yeah, could mean death in those days. So the whole ethos, so when the, so there's a strange, you know, if you were talking to one of these uh, anthropologists, they would remind you, and quite right, correctly so, that the woman's sexuality, right, even the missionary position, and you know, like if you look at animals and the estrus, as opposed to menstruation, there's a vast, incredible difference between animal sexuality and, and the strange human variety. Hmm. And that dates to a certain time. So, you know, there's things I haven't had time to publicly explore, but there's these crossover points because the, the books, the Bible and the, and the apocryphal text seem to say there's a sexual connection. But what kind of sexual connection? It must have been towards the Nephilim to the, cis, to the women, not the other way around necessarily. And that's what made me think that the motive then, all crimes have a motive, right? The motive of the women wasn't sexual. They may have been turned on by the beauty of these men. Beauty is something that goes back ancestrally. But it was the, it was the promise of power. It was the promise of technological, magical, upgrading power, not sex. Sexuality was on the side of the Nephilim for the women here. So that, that's a little nuance, a little uh, interesting thing to pick up for those people who have been studying, studying that kind of thing. But as I said, just the very fact that start, all of this unpacking starts with man realizing he's the worker ant. He is the worker bee in the hive. You know, this beehive that these uh, masons seem to love. Mm. And that no matter how far up the ladder you look, this is what I've done, because it's focused on the top of the pyramid, right? We are not the navigators. Obama is not the navigator. Clinton wasn't. Blair wasn't. Churchill wasn't. Zbigniew Brzezinski isn't. Hmm. So you keep looking up higher, you see, or let, let's say you use the metaphor of the other side of the pyramid, or the, you, know, you turn the Rubik's Cube of the pyramid, but there's always a dark side of it. So the whole thing was to keep looking at what that might be, because who are the actual navigators, and what is the map that they have in their head? Can we get you know, a bird's eye view? Can we deduce forensically that that group exists? And I believe that in the female Illuminati, we've definitely proved that. It's not just a strictly female group because the acolytes are, are male. So it's not it's not some rant against women kind at all. You know, people will see that. And we've also decoded that this is a super secret group, which often people use against you. Going, there's no proof of these people existed. They're very secret. Well, of course they are. They're criminal. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, a guy who's going to rob a bank, you think he's going to go and tell everybody? It's axiomatic that they're, they, they want anonymity. No this one used a, to believe in the a, mafia. No one used to think the mafia there, existed until all of a sudden, boom, now right. we make TV shows about it. Excellent point. The FBI denied the existence of the mafia for years. Yeah. Ordinary people living in the Italian quarters go, it is uh, obvious. Hmm. The FBI, right, didn't know that they existed or denied that they existed. So this is exactly it. And still today, people don't have a handle on how many secret societies are operating out of Rome, out of the city of London, you lose count of them. Although I made sure that I mentioned some of the more powerful houses that might not be even factored in by most people. The, you know, the houses of Spain, Holland, Portugal, and even Hungary, for that matter. It's an interesting line of study there, especially with the Astor houses. Uh, always making sure that you realize that just because they come from a country, just like the British royals do from Britain, it doesn't mean that they have any allegiance to Britain. The Astor houses may be Hungarian. They've sold Hungary out. That's a family sitting on the on what the spoils of what the enemies of their country gave them, right? So that's what the Hungarians got to wake up, burn those buggers out. Yeah. The same ones done in Spain, the same ones in Portugal, the same ones in Ireland. You know, the Cecils, of whom the Guinness clan are related. And it could go on and on and on like I've done in Brotherhood of the Bell. All these oligarchical families don't even necessarily, the ones from Belgium, they don't even necessarily come from those countries. The British royal family didn't even speak English until a few you know decades ago. There was pure German that they spoke. 
So they put up a flag right on top of the stately home, and everybody goes, okay, they're British. My God, these are colonizers. You don't even know where they're from, and they have the most obscure you know, history. Some families were ready to die out, so the higher ones go, grab that family. This is exactly what happened with Prince Charles' family, the, the King Philip, you know, the Prince Philip. That was a house called Oldenburg. It was in Greece and other countries. It was part of this whole Habsburgian Hanover and thing. But it was, it was a line that it was dying out. Some of the lines are, you know, have this. So they immediately grab this impoverished, weakened, impotent line and say, marry in with a big, powerful dynasty to keep your line going. And now that we've kept your line going, you're going to serve us. So the British royal family is an amalgam of the Bose Lion family, the Battenberg, then it was changed to Mount Batten, a bunch of pedophiles, a bunch of psychos. Right, Oldenburg, you see, uh, who else we got in there? Saxe, Coburg, Gotha, right? Mm. So it's wrong to say, oh, they're German. That's where the, that's where the degeneracy lies, those bloody Germans. Oh, no, it's, they're, they're Belgian. Or, oh, no, wait, they're, they're uh, British, or they're Dutch, or they're Catholic, or they're Protestant. See, as long as you're lost in all of that, attributing to these vampires, it's a, it's a vampire. Yeah. Right? One day it wears... Manchester United, and the next day it's Liverpool, right? <laughs> Are you going to, you know, it's, it's a vampire, get it? It comes out at night and it sucks your blood. Yeah. And it will do whatever it, it wants to ingratiate itself with the host. Yeah. So when Count Dracula is sailing up your channel to come to your town, he's going to wave, what, you think he's going to wave the flag of your enemies? He's going to salute you and send you the, the signals that you want to make you fuzzy all over. He's going to say, I'm... On flag in order to insinuate himself in. So these this dark lodge of degenerates in Italy, right? They have one face. Your college of cardinals, your propaganda due, and a host of other enormously and powerful secret societies that have come out of there. You know, and and they've they've helped to fund other anarchist groups, and they do that because they want to keep other rebellious, especially younger men, all over the world in Italy, in Ireland, suppressed. So the secret societies there, they don't operate as secret societies, they operate as anarchist groups funding other people to, when they know that genuine revolution is going to come, as it always comes when you have young men doing their thing, hmm. but then you want to be able to get in there and, and, and uh, either, either destroy it or maneuver it. it. It actually serves you for another purpose that you've got much later on in the board game, but if Giuseppe Mazzini or Garibaldi, you know, or... Theobald Wolf Tone, or one of these other characters that we read, you know, especially Eamon D. Valera, there's all these, you know, they all fall into this occult world. And then say, well, we need them right now to be a champion just for a short time because we have another agenda that we want to make sure it doesn't happen. So we manipulate that to get that. There's, a, there's, a, there's an alternative history that could happen here. We don't want that. We don't want the Welsh people rising up to, you know, break away and succeed. We don't want the southern states of America getting all into, you know, we don't need you, federal government. Hmm. And so then you can decode history by the fact that these foments, young Turks, young Italians, young Irish, all these movements, right? The wave of uh, revolution that spanned Europe during the, the 1840s uh, and 1880s because they knew they were going to take down Germany. We saw the takedown in the 19, first it was an attempt, remember, in the First World War, 1914. Then the big, the real topple of Germany came in 45. It was planned 100 years before by the British intelligence because it takes time to to do a big project like that. And in the way of doing it, they've got to think about Ottoman Empire. They've got to think about the, the, the Dutch Boers in South Africa. Mm. They've got other you know, fish to fry. That's how these geostrategists work. So sometimes it takes only, it's a nothing problem and a couple of years of our secret agents out there and we'll, we'll hand it to you on a plate. Others, it takes centuries. So we have to you know, pull back, go forth, pull back, go forth and discover what these secret societies are, how many hydras, especially these Grand Orient lodges and what have you. So the British royal family is that. And then they have their agents that spread into America, a whole host of them, mostly run by aristocratic people. That's what the, some of the aristocrats of these families, not all, by all means, but some of the more evil ones, they were then uh, championing these little schools, these little clutches of other secret agents that then would be funded, uh, you know, and, and then they'd move out into wherever they're sent. So it's like a chain of command run from the central headquarters you know, in, in England and in Belgium and places like that. And then they orchestrate these incredible agents. And then as the TV age came, as media came, they, they, cha they changed tactics again and said, we need, like Lenin had already told them, 
you need to have your agent provocateurs within that. And so this Dionysian aspect then, which I believe is very much plays, is, is very much orchestrated by the sisterhood, um, came about where you throw up these Dionysian androgynous people's champions, you see, and it's been done today. And first you might uh, sell them to the people by just putting them in a band or a crazy movie that gets a bit cult success, you know, or, or like a sort of a Russell brand, right? Hmm. Uh, and you just need to decode the term Russell brand to know all you need to know. Just those two words tell you everything if you know what you're looking at. But that type of airhead, right, who then spawns a bunch of other little anarchist know-nothings to wear the T-shirt, right? And always behind it, in tattoo form, is your double-headed eagles, your serpents, your fleur-de-lis. In other words, the symbolism, the skulls, the pyramids. They're not even really hiding it. I mean, you know, it, it, how, how obvious does it need to be, right? But that extrapolates back to very, very powerful people. Not all the royals. This is another mistake. They're not all involved, but they're, they're, they're powerful individuals there who are just absolutely obsessive. And so we, once we, we learn this, we discover how it's a, a filter down situation, you know. Uh, and where by the time it reaches us, it's usually in the form of some people's champion or some advocate in the media selling us this, like an Oprah Winfrey character, selling us this adulation of the British royals, like you mentioned earlier. Um, and just a lot of other rubbish that they want to infect the heads of the, of the, the guys and the gals, you know. And that's why at the end we made that call, remember, to women, saying, I can only direct you, but these are women who is in this gynocracy. And so women, you women, the good women, have the tools as women to know how to take them down. Yeah. You know, it's wrong symbolism for the man to do it. I don't know if you people grasp that, but it just is. This is the women who need to armor up, just like the ancient Celtic women used to wear armor and go out there. And if, you, if you've read their exploits, it was ferocious, right? Or like the Finnish women in Finland fighting the Soviets. You do not want to fuck with them, right? <laughs> so right, yeah. women have a history of fighting evil that is equal, if not even greater, to man fighting evil, by the way. Hmm. So there's the criminal history of women, but you study the history of Finland during the Soviet occupation. You thought the 300 Spartans to the Persians was a story worth telling? Hmm. Anybody heard about the Finnish women fighting for their land just short time ago? We're talking historically recent times, and there's many other instances of this. So women today need to don that. First, you're the most powerful you know, demographic of people who are spending money on the magazines and on the products and all the rest of it. You have that power already in your hands. You don't have to invent it. You've got it already. You hold the economy of that, uh, you know, 50 to 80% of the economy of America is in the hands of women with credit card spending and product spending and media spending. You already have the power in your hand. And you're going to turn around to the agents of the sister and say, no, we know who you are now. We're not buying into your stuff. And I'm not letting my daughters be polluted with your muck, your atavistic muck. You know, because that's what it is. It's helping to regress an entire nation into this poisonous, Stygian, Medusan world and where hatred of men, and that's just one part of it, yeah. clawing hatred of men. with no reason behind it, but that's what the daughters are being taught, an automatic response to not only the malignant men, but also to good men as well. So your baby gets thrown out with a bath water. And so the man is sort of, this is not his field, this is not his arena of fight. This is one where the woman arms up, like you saw in Tolkien, when who, who's the one who actually took down the Lord of the Nazgul, right? Yeah. You think this professor talking was on drugs? He didn't know what he was talking about, right? And she's pointed out as being a daughter of the sword, right? It's like, yeah, well, that's what we're talking about here. You can't be standing on the hill going, oh, hold my baby in my hands and let the guys do it. It's not even their field. There's some combatants here that's not even in the field of the man to do it. It's the wrong symbolism. He's, he, he doesn't have the tools. He's in the dark. It's the woman and her consciousness and her atavistic thinking in a positive way that matches the black sisterhood on the other side, see? So, the, so this program, rather than being any sort of misogynist rant, is actually a call to arms of the, of the warrior female in a true and holistic manner to get up and say, no more of this shit. We've decoded you, we've understood you, we know what you're doing. It's bad for man and it's bad for us. Women in the world have suffered under you because you're the, you're the thing that ignited the masculinity that came and then persecuted us to your inquisitions. Hmm. You're still doing it through the through the psychic rape Right? Because their writings are a form of psychic rape. Their billboards are a form of psychic rape. Their TV programs, their, their personification. We've talked about this so many times, but the, person, you know, the uh, media images of the malignant masculinity and femininity, these exaggerated versions. 
That's their handi handiwork. And so the, the parent, especially the mother, who has dominion over the consciousness of the child, needs to then show more healthy archetypes. And that's already written in the great works, like the story of Robin Hood. What is the story of Robin Hood? The positive masculine archetype, as opposed to the malignant one that's in the Sheriff of Nottingham, say, and the, uh, who's the other guy? You know, the Prince John, that kind of thing. Yeah. And you have Richard the Lionheart, you know, and his agent, Robin Hood and his merry men, all archetypes, Ellen and Dale, Will Scarlet, right? Little They're John. All, and, huh? yeah. Little John and Friar Tuck and Little all those John, guys. Oh, yeah. Friar Tuck, exactly. Yeah. These are archetypes written by sages. These were great, great stories that go back to antiquity about the wild man archetype and what that represents. But how many parents, we talked about this earlier, is, is their child in school being introduced to the wild man archetype? No. Is the girl being introduced to anything except the princess and the pea? Yeah. Fucking archetype? That's about as far as you get. And that's what they're acting like. Yeah. Where's the warrior woman? Where's the woman who knows, hey, did you, oh, I know what you don't know. My parents have told me there's a war between good and evil going on on this planet into which I've been born. Right? I'm, I'm choosing sides. <laughs> they don't know what you're talking about. It's like, where, when is the mall open? Yeah. Right? Yeah, all these archetypal things that are going on, which make a man a man and a woman a woman, the masculine and feminine fight, whether it's a racial fight or some other kind of fight, it's going on whether you like it or not. Are you joining the fight? You have, in the end, you're going to be, the sides will be chosen for you or you'll choose it yourself. And so the politics that's coming out of Strasbourg, right, the politics that's coming out of the EU is all this dark feminization. And it's for women to counter it and to, and to educate men. To say, let, let us show you the difference between positive femininity and mass and, and the mass, you know the more positive and the negative femininity. It's for women to draw those pictures. In the Nordic tradition, in the Irish tradition, you have it. Remember, I talked about the Volva and the Shidor in the Norse myths, right? Uh, there's these two warring factions. There's the red dragon and the white dragon in Arthurian legends. In uh, Irish mythology, you have exactly the same concept of the daughters of light versus the daughters of darkness. And in East, you have the Kali, you know, versus the, the other schools. You see, it, it, it's uh, in every single culture. So women need to then take the blinders off, realize that they are slowly being made into dumbed-down creatures so that they can be, as we said at the end, a very sinister ritual is going on in which the vacuity of their minds and their daughters' minds is actually for a ritualistic purpose. Because there's this transplantation. I know it sounds very bizarre. But that's why the sister had so much a focus on Astral alignments, times of the day and night, concoctions, the underworld rituals, bizarre rituals. So they show this in all the rock videos and pop stuff that's going on, every latest Madonna thing. Every, every They're just using these people as agents to sell you the rites and rituals to, to, act, to atavistically get you back into thinking in those terms. They even do it with products. They even sell the cosmetics to the women that are actually... Uh, Euphemisms for this elixir, right? For the for the for the elixir of life, for eternal youth, right? There's a whole cult thing going on right in the very products that women are using, let alone the magazines they're buying and all the rubbish they're watching on TV and stuff. There's all this ritualistic stuff in the music and the artwork and all the rest of it. Uh, and I'm just a person who says people should become conscious of this and realize how pernicious it is. You know, the shapes of the bottles. Hmm. Take, take Chanel, take I mean, you could, uh, there's no one company, it's a, the whole thing, right? But the shape of the bottles, the X's, the O's, right, the S's, the whole thing is just unbelievable when you start getting into it. It's like they're getting anointed into these cults, into this, this cult-like exactly. mentality, and it's a very ritual thing that is not really looked at. Everybody goes, ah, that's just, you're paranoid. But when you look at the symbolism, and then you look at what's being turned out from the media, like you said, just the darkest, most twisted, seducery type of um, witchcraft, really. I can't that's say it any other way. And that is what is being blared into the eyes and ears of our kids and especially young girls and being a father of young of a young girl i you know automatically my hackles get up and i want to raise her to have her hackles up so that she knows how to defend her mind yeah and without putting fear or paranoia into them no you just say that you state it academically you state it neutrally yeah and you just show them to be aware of it oh snake jump let's get out of the way of the snake simple as that right yeah but you know the symbolism the halos you know, the constitution of some of the drinks, like Pepsi, you know, it's the dark piss of the serpent. Yeah. Pepsa, like Coke, is, is an ancient word going back, it means phallus. <laughs> you know, uh, 501 is the, is the gematria for phallus. You see, so the, the, Red everywhere. Bull, right, Red Bull, that's a very interesting Red thing. Bull, yeah. yeah. That's right. And the yeah. bull is the sun lover. We'll be talking about this in the strength card. 
that the sun lover is pictorialized by the lion. That's why it shows up on that card. Uh, but the lion is a, the original god, sun lover of Asherah. It was called the lion faced. You don't find any lions anywhere, of course, right? <laughs> and the bull, and the other, the other symbol of the little calf is the bull calf, mm. and all the symbolism is surrounded with bull, like red bull, and, and using the horns. It's not always evil, but the sisterhood uses it a lot. You know, all these airheads using that symbol. Yeah. That's the horns of the bull saying, "Let's Lucifer." That's the bull sun. We're really, we're really of the goddess, but remember, she's unspoken. We don't draw your attention to her. So she's created a little androgynous Dionysian love child, and we mention him. But he's like Jesus. He's like Adonis. He's half male, half woman. You don't get that. He's goddess peeking out behind a sword. But they fused a female and masculine face together. That's the androgyne. It's really the goddess they're worshipping, the dark Stygian goddess. But they, she's hidden. Remember, said of the Isis of the Seven Veils. You're not mentioned to mention her. You don't symbolize her directly. You do it through specular means. You, you do it through mirrors. So the, the Mick Jagger, David Bowie, Kurt Cobain... Mark Bolin, Jimi Hendrix even, right? Uh, Bob Marley, some are consciously participatory, others are definitely not. Your Brian Joneses, he didn't know if he was coming or going until they finally had to club him on the head because he was getting wise, right? Oh, shit, we can't have that. Or the mind control is wearing off, or the sister would just go, sacrifice, <laughs> and do it at the right time of his life, the age, and do it at the right time astrologically. So unless you're sitting there monitoring it, Unless you're aware of lunar calendars, unless you're aware of stellar calendars, and even the solar calendar is a good starting place, start looking at what's going on when these ritual things take place. You know, August 15th, St. John the Baptist Day, World Revolution takes place on that day over here. May 15th, Mer Mercuralia, the day of the Illuminati meet together. Uh, another revolution takes place over there, you know. The, the first, uh, the first uh, movie with uh, Angelina Jolie. What's that, that series of films that she made? Oh, the Tomb Raider. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to read in between the lines. Like we were talking earlier about the movies. There you are, and the, and the, and the, when the Illuminati meet in this magnificent hall. I think it's even in Venice, for that matter, or it's in a place very similar to Venice. Yeah. As the camera pulls out after they've had their meeting, and the camera pulls out, I believe you not only see checkered floors and all that stuff, but there's two gigantic black horses. Outside the portal of where these Illuminati are meeting on May 15th, the Mercuralia. Two big giant black horses. Now, I challenge anybody to look through the, any documentary, any sitcom, any show or program or film, and just note the plethora of horses, especially black horses, that you see in the background. And it could be, a, a, you know, it could be L.A. Law, it could be any of the, the Melrose Place, I don't care what. The black horse, the prevalence of it, and other symbols that we're talking about. And so some symbolize, you know, the Welcome Company, right? The pharmaceutical company used the black horse. Ferrari used the black horse. They're from Italy, right? That's a Illuminati symbol. You've got Alfa Romeo using the red cross and the dragon. And from the dragon is coming the man from the mouth of the dragon. Hmm. That's Pen Dragon. That's the, the dragon progeny. Hmm. That's the sisterhood giving birth to another man who's going to be the, the hero right from another knight. And he's a knight because there's a secret society symbolism behind the Alfa Romeo beside it, right? And that symbol is used a lot because it's disgorging another agent. It's giving birth to the womb or the mouth. They're, they're, they're metaphors for the same thing. The dragon progeny. The, remember I showed the picture of the uh, saint holding a little lion dragon? And that's the child. That's, that's, that's her offspring. So we have a dragon offspring. And on all the symbols that we look at, we find their logos. We find their little wave to us. A pentagram here. A seven-pointed star there, a double cross of Lorraine there, or through the fiction of Ian Fleming and the James Bond or the fiction of Tomb Raider or whatever you've got. There's so much of it, you know, the X-Files. Uh, and then you get the whistleblowing version as well, which I particularly like. You know, we always have to show that there's another side working that is indeed exposing this. But It's, it's funny, too, in the movies that they've, they're, you're talking about, the antagonists, they are very feminine in nature. They're, they're very... Uh, they're not strong masculine archetypes at all. No. Uh, even in a lot of the James Bond films or a lot of the uh, you know big films, they're very. They have a even in the new Dark Knight, you had the Joker. He had a much more kind of he was creepy, but he had a more feminine kind of hands off approach. Uh, there was just this very interesting thing, and they always are this mastermind. They're able to put all the pieces together. They're brilliant. They're very intelligent. They're very organized. They're uh, it, it's just it's interesting the symbolism alone of just looking at the bad guys in some of these the arch villains in some of these films 
I had a I had a biography of uh, Marianne Faithful, the famous singer, dilettante, and uh, she was sort of an archetypal figure during the, the you know the sixties, socialite, totally Dionysian. Her father was military intelligence, but they're also Jewish, Hungarian royalty, hmm. right? So. I, I, using the symbolic literacy, I'm, I'm flicking through her biography, amazing, I, I actually wish I could have shown them and maybe on some other thing we do, uh, we can get into showing some of the symbolism. Her entire house where she lives is filled, and I mean filled, even, even the decor, let alone what she has just as knickknacks, is shells, scallop shells and pearls, you know, like the whole Aphrodite, Ceramus, Venus symbolism. Her house is just that's her, one of her favorite symbols. It's all sisterhood symbolism. I'm reading her biography, the very first line, the very first line in the biography, she's describing her mother, tongue in cheek, and she goes, my mother was a real Medusa. Hmm. Like, this is, again, it's just, it's just the words you think, but she's letting you know some behind the scenes, she goes, my mother, a real snake-headed Medusa type, or something like that. And I'm yeah. looking at it going, unbelievable. From the first line, this person is using the occult language to say, I am a sister of, of this mother who is connected to this. So it's not going to be obvious. They play, like you say, the trickster. So anywhere you see the trickster turning up, even if it appears to be a male, it's this hydra, it's this chameleon. And through the, through the words that they're saying, you know, uh, you will be able to decode. So, so many of the terms, Venice, Venetian, right? Venus and Venice, the town of Venice. So that's one of their capitals, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Study the history of Venice. You'll find out amazing things. Venice turned up in uh, some of the first Madonna videos, like a, like a virgin. Mm. There's your Madonna virgin tie-in, right? It sounds holy from the Bible. No, she's speaking of it in a cult version. She's standing on a bloody checkered floor. There's a lion, and then it's in Venice. And all the James Bond movies that you know, start in Venice, and all the other symbolism uh, uh, that corresponds to that town, or a look-alike town, like Am Amsterdam, maybe even Paris, and, and other, other places as well. Or bridges. Or, you know, I put up a picture on uh, Facebook, uh, on my enslaved page of, again, the, the image, I think it's this time from Caravaggio, I can't remember the artist, of uh, John the Baptist. And there, where Salome is meant to be, you see her as being this weird syzygy. You see her being like two-headed. Yeah, it, it's actually a person coming from behind, but the artist has made it so it's like two heads on one shoulder. One is a beautiful female, that's a Salome, you know, with the head of the Baptist in front of her. And the other one is an old crone-like, almost masculine figure, but it's probably a female who's old and crone-like. So there's your two sisters. There's your, the, 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 every woman is two in one. So although this happened in ancient times, what we're talking about is rooted in ancient times. In our modern age, this conflict, this battle, and this choice is still going on. Women today who are serving the echelon, I mentioned them on my female Illuminati site, my estimation anyway of who, who's, who's involved with the sisterhood, agents of the sisterhood, let's say, through the symbolism that they're wearing and what have you. These women are re either recruited or they're from the families themselves, and then they, you know, they, they're at the top of, they're the editors of the famous women's magazines. They're at the head of these various uh, sociological org orgs. Mm -hmm. They're the ones, again, you know, serving the EU people, right? You know, they have the highest positions of the land right now. And to tear them down, if a man tries to do it, he's going to be immediately labeled as what? Some lunatic misogynist, isn't it? So unfortunately, it's time for women to armor themselves up and suit themselves up and go and deal with it because the man is simply going to be arrested on the spot, so to speak, and yeah. thrown into a straitjacket. We know what you're all about, mate. Come on. You know, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, it's, just, it's more for the women to be the vanguard in this and start to say there's an occult agenda going on and we don't have to be rabid evangelistic Christians to prove it because uh, we're not saying that the symbolism is satanic in that way because that, that's a dead end that doesn't lead anywhere it's probably well-meaning in, in some instances but it's not going to lead anywhere you know for reasons we've already pointed out in other in other works it has to be a different kind of group of people who know that an occult agenda is at work and just like in brotherhood of the bell where that man goes along to, and, 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 and uh, risks the loss of everything including his marriage but he won't stop until it is Accomplished because he knows that the whole of the human race, you know, see, is 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 uh, jeopardized here. Hmm. So we need that kind of commitment. We need that kind of commitment. The same kind of commitment people give to political parties and political agendas. You know, it should shift now into an open study of the criminal history of these royal families, 
the open exposure of these uh, Masonic orbs and in other programs I've done, I've even showed that they have trouble within. All is not okay within, actually. There's yeah. a meltdown. They're hiding it, but it's, there's a tremendous meltdown happening. So if we can attack from outside intellectually, there, there's already a weakness and a breaking of ancient, ancient cords of tradition. Some of the younger people who are now initiated into these families are going, what's it all about? For yeah. God's sake, I don't want, <laughs> I'm not, you know, conquering nations and all that shit. I want nothing to do with it. Mm. Yeah. So there's a good chance now that, you know, you can move in at the right place, the little hobbits, and amazing things can be done. You know, it's definitely a, a, an important time. And I guess that for from the male perspective, we got enough to take care of on our end. You know, we got to take care of the malignant male forces that That's work in right. the world, the police, the military, the the poli these guys that are up there. We have to be positive influences and bring forward that positive, uh, you know, real masculine energy. That's why I've been working so hard to reignite the warrior tradition in its real authentic form and getting away with all the bunk that we've been told about all these martial artists and these warriors and these emperors and how they were hired became hired mercenaries and they completely decimated the true warrior tradition which is coming from a lot of these ancient uh, mystery school traditions as well it's the same it's mm -hmm. that same thing as i've discovered and trying to bring it forward into a modern context to empower people to empower mm -hmm. both men and women with just the basic skill sets and tool sets um, physically spiritually and emotionally where they can take on the tyrant within as well as you know the tyrants that are running loose in our society um, this is the time when we we really all have to focus in on where we can apply our work the men are going to deal with the malignant men the women absolutely it's going to take a woman to dethrone these uh, you know these dark priestesses right I think it's it is because remember it is women who are under attack men are already in the bag so to speak hmm. um, and as I said before, I don't even men don't even have the hard wiring to take on this fight. This is a this is a fight that only women can understand. Mm. So Diana had the uh, huntress, right? She was with a bow and arrow, right? You have I said the Celtic warrior says, right? There's something about this fight where the man really is 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 uh, in that he has jobs like you say changing. His attitude in the, towards the female in the masculine way, you know, dealing with his own malignancy. Women have a play, part to play in that by the forgiveness, right? They need to start admiring men as opposed to envying. But in in the whole, in short, women are under attack because women are the solution. The sisterhood knows what I'm just said. The sisterhood knows women are the only one to fear here. Mm. So that's why they are under more attack even than men. This is what women have to understand. You are the ones who are under attack. Your psyche, your daughters are all more under attack because they know you carry the real key of salvation to the whole human race. So they're going to work on you more. And that's in a multiplicity of ways, and it's a learning curve to get to know how they're doing that through the estrogen, through the, the cesarean sections, through the loveless births that they're forcing you to have, yeah. through the whole medicalization of the human race through memes that are demeaning men so that will awaken more of the your your if they can awaken this envy and hatred of man then the woman becomes like they are isn't it that's identification yeah. an ordinary woman goes i actually really want to come down. i got no reason to hate men why do i hate them because you've been entrained by the media and that makes you align with their side now not only that but there's other things that are making you lose will collectivism see women discovered in the pre in this nursery period one of the beneficial things against the world against animals and against you know, evil men, women discovered that the collective, when they, when they collectivize amongst themselves, they originally did it because of menstruation and other things. It was just a synchro synchronization of the menstrual period. But an added, uh, an added bonus that came from that was the strength in numbers. Hmm. It was the first instance. Men are strong individually, right? That's where their individual power is. But women realized, you know, if we get together uh, in a strong way, you know, it's through this collectivism that we make decisions, that we protect the tribe, and that we're even, you know, we strengthen ourselves where we're not strong individually. So today, the constant means of communitarianism, collectivism, is aimed again at the woman, not the man. The man is, is instinctively resistant to collectivization. And some women are, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't have had an Ayn Rand, would we? <laughs> but the main message of, to the woman is collectivize, collectivize. Therein lies your strength. Global village, there lies in your strength. Remember I said another work about the, not only the panopticonization, but this whole symbolism of the mother that they're using when they even give you pictures of this uh, 
panopticon to come. When they're, when they're giving you the image of the global village, it's in a very female, one-click, push-button, air-conditioned, you know, safe, motherly image. Aphrodite is, is symbols are used a lot. Hmm. All mother symbolism used, when they sell you this image of the perfect, uh, you know, hive in which we're all meant to be, to be living. So, and there could be a positive connotation to that if it was meant in that way, in the sense that if we look at, you know, the earth as the mother, right, and you look at the, the positive female aspect of, you know, working in a more harmonious way, but when it's used for collectivized hive mind, you know, getting rid of the whole individuality thing, you know, that's where we're looking at it becoming something that's very dark and malignant, right? It is, and uh, women are also part of the healing because you know, it's trauma that brought all this about. The weakness of men, the systemic weakness of the human race was born out of trauma, right? Well, women have even a role in presenting artwork, in presenting films, in presenting documentaries, and, and also su suggesting manner, right? They were once the keepers of the herbalism. Mm -hmm. They were the, they were the uh, keepers of the healing arts. Well, we need healing arts more than we ever have, not just physically, but psychologically. So there's a whole psychological tie-in here that women are going to be harbingers of the healing of the ancient trauma by bringing the past. You can't go back. There's no time machines to take us back to those moments, but we can bring the trauma to consciousness, right? You can bring it forward. And it's, it, it, these uh, archetypes of destruction are in the tarot. They're in astrology. They've been pictorialized. They're in the artwork. They're in our racial memory. And if you read a Velikovsky, you realize how much they're in our memory. And as I said, you know, we're using these terms every day. We don't even realize where they come from. So, there's definitely a need to overthrow the, the evil, malignant patriarchy. There's no question that I'm in favor of that. These popes and priests and royals, they've got to go, right? I mean, that's, that's certainly on the agenda. But there's another whole side of psychological healing that unless women get with the gig here and, and understand their role as the mendicants, the archimandrites. Remember it said, I'm told, I think we did in the female Illuminati, that no temple could ever be built without the representative of the goddess. The stellar goddess had to be there. That's what that Statue of Liberty, why she's got stellar horns. Yeah. There's the whole country of America is a temple. Initiate, and the representative of the goddess is there on Ellis Island. So in psychological terms is the foundation of the new shrines of freedom, justice, and truth. That is a foundation stone that must have the female there present. The sacerdotal female must uh, be there. Well, not the airheads we've got today. They've got to be into this work so that they can re they can initiate themselves into this uh, sisterhood, the positive sister. You know, they can claim claim their scepter and then be there in harmony with their counterparts to then you know uh, lay the foundation stones of, of the greater uh, shrines of truth. Just like you said, in the products they're using, they're symbolically anointing themselves to the dark sister. Slap this shit on you. You know, and you become an animal. Hmm. You become a feline. You become a, pred a predatory person. You know, like Salem cigarettes and all the rest of it. Just you become a predator. You weren't one very. You weren't doing a very good job before. Smoke this cigarette or slap this shit on you, and now you're going to be a you know man killer. Hmm. And then behind that is even even more sinister. I mean, you just need to look at the ad copy. So you have to initiate yourself out of that. That's one step. Then you initiate yourself back into by the wisdom, the baptism of wisdom. That's what Baphomet means. Baptism and wisdom back again into the higher, because it's either dark female sister that you choose, or it's the uh, sophic sister that you choose, and to represent you. And then when you're initiated with the knowledge, you now can be there to not only uproot the foundations of the rotten edifice that you know we've all been laboring under in the shadow of it, but you can also lay the foundation of something more positive. So this is, this is essential. <clears throat> but it's the women who need to get out there and make their new magazines, new artwork, new books, new new avenues so that this can be accomplished well this is all so thought-provoking michael and i think that as you said we're just scratching the surface of this work i remember even uh in just some of our private conversations about the female illuminati we skipped over whole bits on female psychology and all that other elements as well um and so <laughs> folks that are listening when you watch the female illuminati program um the length of it the depth of it is really just it, we're just starting on this, and it'll just really start. Off the board. Oh, exactly, and that and that that and, and you have to watch it start to finish. You, you really do take it in small bites if you need to, but honestly, book the day off, sit there and watch it start to finish. When I did that, 
you're just going to have all kinds of bells going off in your head and you're really going to have actually some positive tools at the end of it, you know, very solution oriented. This isn't just about, like you said, slinging mud at one particular group. This isn't just uh, focusing on the negative or anything. This is actually extremely positive process of looking at the trauma of the past. Um, we've done it with, you know, the dark brotherhoods and whatnot. It was time to do it for the sisterhoods and the female aspect. And I think when we can really step back and eventually tie all this together, we're going to have a very good understanding and foundation to look back at history again, pull something back into the present and really, really start affecting positive change on this planet. Yeah. Uh, and Chris is working on uh, making it more sumptuous. Yep. So in just a few weeks, uh, we're up updating the actual program itself so that little bugs are taken out and you know it, it's looking more pristine so that, that's enjoyable. Uh, those who've already bought it will have that to go and they've seen it evolve and we'll be doing radio shows on because again this is something to unpack. I got the website so people can go over there because there's an interesting interview with Robert Morning Sky mm. because one of the things we jumped over was this whole thing about whether men are really altered females when it comes to a genetic level. Remember the Y and X chromosomes and the XX and the strength of the X chromosome over the Y. And even some people are thinking the Y chromosome is a later, far, far later, almost aberration, so that men are really altered females. There's a whole, and, and, and again, this isn't just modern genetic science. That echoes ancient lore. Mm. And Rob Morning Sky, his interview, which I posted on the Female Illuminati website, go to site pages, that's the link at the top, that'll open, and then you'll see sisterhood symbolism one, two, and three. Go to three, go to all of them, but on, on Sisterhood Symbolism 3, there's an interview from Robert Morning Sky, very much worth listening to, you know, halfway to the end. It starts more like in the th th three quarters of the way through. There's another very, very important interview that I only had time to skip through, which was of, a, of Christopher Knight, who's a yeah. Scottish writer, Mason, openly admitting, just like Giuseppe Mazzini, just like this uh, Anderson had done in previous ages, telling you absolutely and against his own will originally that there is a steering group behind Scottish Rite, his own order. He has no clue what it is, but he knows it exists. And he's a man who said you had to drag me kicking and screaming because he used to have a right laugh at all the conspiracy people who said that there was you know, something more sinister behind masonry. Mm -hmm. He was never a believer until he himself absolutely had to break ranks with that. Listen to that interview. It's more, we were going to actually play it in the interval because it's, you know, the part he was talking was only five, eight minutes, but the whole interview is longer. So I would suggest go over there. We couldn't put it into the program. So listen to that interview. And maybe Chris, you know, at some point can, can insert it. We can put it, yeah, absolutely. In our timeline. But it's there anyway. And there's several other excellent videos that are always being added new. So the Robert Morning Sky, the Christopher Knight, uh, there's a whole fantastic program there on René Le Chateau, leaving you no, no doubt at all that something very obscure is going on that has nothing to do with Catholicism as we know it. And at these Teutonic Knights, Knights Templar, uh, various orders, all the equestrian orders, but even the Knights of the Garter on the Protestant side, and what anybody can see from just studying that stuff that it is absolute, as Tassarian says, nonsense. The Protestant Catholic thing does not go higher. It does not carry up. You can see that in the degree ceremonies. You can see the Egyptian Atmos symbolism. Who's this Skoda that it's all based on? You see, all of these things, who Mary is just a front. So it's not just even Mary. It's not just Isis and uh, Osiris. Even behind that is something more and more and more. So the, dig, the further back you dig, the more you see these connections. You see this move to Ireland, which then became central. And as we said before, a great need of these oligarchs to literally not have anyone from those societies rise up in their face. They know it will happen. It has happened. But whenever a James Connolly or Patrick Pierce or Daniel O'Connell, legitimate rebels, rise up, you've got to have a net ready to capture them. You have to have the king's men, you see, to grab and, and immediately, immediately, they have this metaphor in a movie that Richard Chamberlain acted in called The Man in the Iron Mask. It's the one from the 70s and that's Patrick McGowan in it. Is there a line in that film that isn't alchemical? Mm -hmm. or about the conspiracy and the whole idea of how they capture you know the king the prince the real king out of his bed and, and take him away to be in prison for years all of that is a metaphor that film works on the spiritual metaphor of the soul falling into the earth right the man in the iron mask is all of us 
and the tribulations we have to go through, the ignorance that encapsulates us lifelong unless we know how to break it. You know, but the whole idea that whenever a spiritual force rises in the world, it rings those bells and the agents of, of the evil archy come in to snatch you. And this is done on many, many political levels. And, 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 as, and when we don't become as subtle as them, we lose. We've got to learn their methods. We've got to learn how to, like Aikido, you know, just bend in the breeze and, and wipe them out because we're so smart with how they operate that we use their own force against them. Like an Aikido, nothing needs to be invented new. All the great sages have told us how to overcome evil. We're just not applying it properly. You use their, their own force against them. Like I said at the end of the Atlantis book, if you make yourself so strong, sovereign, you know, psychic immunity, you realize it's a war on consciousness, you arm yourself correctly, then nothing they throw at you damages you. It's just like they're on their ass. You can't that's, be hypnotized by the hypnotist, by the hypnotist, you know, you've seen the it. tricks, you've seen the wires. Yeah. And once you, yeah, once you understand that you, you, you change the, you change the gig on the puppet master and the hobbit overthrows the dark Lord, you know, that is the metaphor. And part of that is dipping back into the past, looking at all of that without prejudice, without scoffing, just see what it has to tell us. And we'll find out that it has a lot to tell us. And then it'll awaken atavistically in the positive atavistic way. Atavism is not just negative. And that's what I say. When women tap into this, you have no idea of the fonts of knowledge that are going to pour forth from their consciousness because this has all been buried in them more than it's been buried in us. They don't give a damn if man knows about this or he doesn't know about it. They're not, we're, we're just workarounds. We're just the worker bees. They're not interested in whether what we know or we don't know. They're very, very worried by what their own psyche knows, right? They're, 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 they're cousins, they're sisters. It's that group that they don't want to wake up. So the Masons can dress themselves in all sorts of female garb. The Knights Templar could keep their hair long, their aprons, right? They'll be there. The hand gestures, the crescent moons, they can stick it right in front of you, but you don't see it because it's female symbolism. <laughs> the, the most incredible, but it's you know mostly negative female symbolism. And as I said, then it's, it's coming into our milieu so that it's not just, oh, this is something to do with some secret society or something. This is affecting every single girl, her diet, her image of herself, have the rape that's taking place, the books they're reading, the shit they're being taught in school, the magazines pouring out this evil shit. And yet there's many positive female archetypes all the way through mythology, all the way through even fiction. There are wonderful archetypes of, of, of femalehood. But those have not been picked up. And as time goes by, they're being laid down. You know, read Ursula Le Guin, the Earth Sea trilogy. The last one is a female character. Uh, uh, yeah, the Earth Sea trilogy. You know, people should should read that. Mathago Woods by Robert Holstock. There's wonderful, wonderful fiction out there. On top of what C.S. Lewis, Professor Lewis, and Professor Tolkien have created, and others as well. George MacDonald springs to mind, and many, many others. But Ursula Le Guin wrote three Atlantean books, the Earth Sea trilogy. And I think it's in the last one, the tomb of Atuan, it's called. There's a female heroine. In the first book, it's a male. And she talks about the destruction of Atlantis, that there was four islands, not one. You see, all this wonderful stuff that people need to, to realize is out there. It's not just the concoctions of Michael Tassarin. You know, because what I've done is just synthesized many, many traditions and then broke it down in sort of more simple terms so people can get you know, little pieces that lead to bigger pieces. Uh, I'm not, I don't like to bite off too much. It's like break it up, approach it from several different angles, and that's a more healthy than just dogmatically beating to death for 10 years, the same old thesis, you know, over and over again. That's boring to me. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's certainly going to be boring the hell out of everybody else, you know. Well, I definitely appreciate what you've done with this, Michael. And uh, I had uh, one final question for you here. It's actually a little bit more political. Uh, it's something I was speaking about with some people recently. And it's concerning the upcoming election in the States where there's possibility of uh, Hillary Clinton getting in. I think we pretty much. I think they have a choice between another Bush and another Clinton this year, and some people were thinking that you know symbolically and ritually, Obama seemed to represent sort of like a more of a pharaonic kind of character, you know, symbolically. And then, of course, now Hillary coming in would sort of bring back the memories of you know the queens of old, and they're the, but they're going to yeah. spin it as well. Obama was the first black president, even though half his family lineage is white and whatnot, and we don't even know where he's from. And then oh, Hillary's gonna be the first female president, even though she's definitely not the first Clinton, so, and whatever her ties are. So I just thought, you know, in, in reference to the female Illuminati, is there any kind of a symbolic reason why they might be going in that direction? Yeah, I think it is a, it's very interesting, and there could be a chance that she gets in, quite a high one, 
more than there's ever been before. I think she is, to me, if she doesn't get in, it's because she doesn't quite fit the symbolism, maybe her age, mm. and also because she was at one point twinned with a man, Bill. There's, so there's, there's evidence that she's you know, suitable, and then there's other evidence that she's not. And one of the things that she's not is her age. So, because I got a feeling that the one that they really want to come in there isn't some old crone. It's some younger, vi vital person like Marianne Williamson or that kind of thing, you know. And there's been in the background anyway, your Barbara Marx Hubbards and your Pamela Harrimans and so many women in the background of politics. And remember, when we're talking about sisterhood symbolism, it goes without saying that it is in the background. So when people talk to me about Clinton, Hillary Clinton getting in in the front, that doesn't really fit the symbolism. I'm saying I could be wrong, and, and, and it might be that they're changing the symbolism. They're so confident now. Mm -hmm. So then I, I would say that, yes, if she gets in, if, and now the sisterhood is saying, we, we're having a representative right out front, then that will mean an epochal change of uh, tactics for them. Because symbolically, as Mera Tappan insisted in the desert, when she formed her syndicate, she's saying the solar guys, you go out front. Any Saturnian stellar lunar thing, which I'm the queen of, we're way in the back, including the, the lunar is really in the back. Mm. They've been so back in the back that, you know, it's not until now that they've even been exposed in my work. This group is extremely Stygian, extremely hidden, and they've made sure that all, anything, anything masculine solar is out front. Why, why would that change? So if Hillary gets in, I don't give a fuck who it is. If she, you know, just the fact that it's a woman, I know that this, the, the symbolism has now changed for the first time. Mm. You know, you, you've had female queens and all of that, and we talked about even the power of some of the queens, like Henrietta the First and, and Aquitaine, Eleanor of Aquitaine and Mary d'Angeau. They've certainly had queens, but when it comes to the, the modern political construct that's only been created about 200 years ago in England, it's not that ancient actually. It, they haven't really put a female figure out in the front. So if they do that, that I would say that constitutes a major seismic change for them in symbolism. Mm. I know what would happen next. She would then be a person who'd work on an archetypal level. First of all, she'd only have liaisons. She'd insist that the, you know women in, the, in countries like the Arabian countries are free. So there'd be some very, very positive stuff that she'd, she'd orchestrate and she'd bring an embargo and she'd insist and she'd get her way. You, what I'm trying to say is this. If Clinton gets in, then you're going to see a lot of pesky ancient problems of politics get solved in no time at all. Whereas before the hand was clenched, suddenly she's, she's like waving her magic wand and all of this good is happening. Women are freed all over the world. The Arabs, have, you know, the Saudis have already, are going to. So you, you see all these things that would spark. Oh, my God, it's fairy dust. Yeah. And even the American economy would strengthen. I, I predict that if she gets in. But there'd all, there'd all be these fires that have been burning for centuries, even now the Palestinian conflict and Jewish conflict. A lot of the stuff would start to go out because of girl power. Yep. All you had to do was let us in. We fought to get in and you didn't let us in. But we always said that we could do it better. Well, see, if a day comes when a woman is made president, they'd be honor bound to back that up. They'd have to justify that cliche that it's girl power. Yep. And, and you know why? To galvanize all the women to go, see... Oh, right. So this would be the selling point, and it would be it would be epidemic. All women would fall for it. This is the danger. They'd really go see. Oh my God! So Sweden is right. Get a get a girl in. Get a girl in over here. Get, and all you patriarchal places like Africa and Saudi Arabia, you're done. The male paradigm is finished. Get the women in, and Hillary Clinton will either set that in motion, and it will become a gynocracy. Uh, and from that point on, you know there'll be some positive, so many positive changes that people will be very satisfied. They're not realizing that under that, the global village is now being more greased. Yeah. The commun communitarianism will be epidemic. The women will vote in all sorts of uh, other Orwellian types of laws because they're so convinced, you see. So in other words, the, the New World Order is a female construct, as we showed, and it'll move forward headlong like a battering ram if there's a female at front. My only reservation is I would see a younger woman there who can appeal to those 20, 30 somethings the young crowd yeah yeah right and because the, it's that crowd that's breeding the next generation of airheads mm. ready to be possessed not the older woman she's kind of done her thing and also symbolically right for thousands of years the older woman does not have a role she is shown in her chair symbolically as an old crone you know like sort of in the, in the old uh, italian catholic dress with the veils you know all corroded and dark and you know 
this is how she's shown uh, in movies, Captain Cronus, Vampire Hunter, brilliant movie, get it out, watch it, and other films in which the old matriarch is confined to a dark room in her shadows, you know, uh, and, and not involved in the world of light anymore. That's for the younger daughter, who's a bit simple, but being groomed and full of her own, you know, spider hate that hasn't quite come out yet, right? Mm. But she's ready to be the next ugly duckling that walks out on the balcony, transforms into this awesome power, right? Mm. And all nations, the whore, the whore of Babylon, so to speak, you know, comes from this little ugly duckling, but she's been groomed because the older woman is a husk who's projected her consciousness into the young child. Not one woman, but the whole matriarchy. And what this really means on one level is the whole matriarchy is now embodied in that woman, like you see in Tomb Raider, and you see in many movies where they're bringing this up. So the transplantation in the younger woman, you see this in Metropolis is what's going on in that film. So the younger woman becomes the Jadis type queen of the world who just, you know, her gaze, people just fall. Like in Red Sonia, the power of it, right? Uh, in which uh, nobody can resist. I see something like that taking place. And then the world political machinery changes radically. And the message is, we just have to have the woman in power. My God, you men made such a mess of it, right? And yeah. this will be wonderful. This will go down in history books. Oh, and, and this will then set in motion the kind of hard communitarianism that the Brzezinski's and other people just hinted at, sort of uh, tenderized us for. But I really do see the symbolism being feminine, female, uh, in the Stygian way. We have to be able to not fall for it. Because when they use all of the symbolism, they'll present it in a classically Sophic way. Like, like the Da Vinci Code movie did, to think that these secret societies have been keepers. Yeah. <laughs> They've been keepers of the light. You know, and they will continue to do this, to say it only took, you know, man defiled it, man corrupted it, but the secret societies that represent this female, so, you know, all that stuff about the Templars and all, all that rubbish. And we'll buy it because they'll still use a symbolism that is, and they're doing it, they're tenderizing you for it through these magnificent spectacles at the Super Bowl, through all this female symbolism from your Britney Spears, right? <laughs> the name alone, right? And all, and the symbolism of all the, you know, the... Just get into Lady Gaga and your mind will be blown after watching this chick is a trip, man. Unbelievable what kind of symbolism she uses. Isn't it? So all of this Lady Gaga stuff, It'll be sanitized to make it look like it's really pure and full of wisdom. Mm. Uh, male agents and acolytes will bow to it and say, oh, we're brilliant. You know, like these archbishops, oh, people serving the sister will come out of the woodwork and go, we're all for it, don't you know? It's yep. brilliant. Yep. Right? Oh, okay. So this is the left hand and the right hand, the good cop, bad cop. And we are going to move into this sort of era of... Uh, yeah, at this point, you know, it's sort of a dystopia, but it's not as been presented in Blade Runner. It's it's this other shining illusion, right? And and so we could be seeing that. They're, I think they're itching. One side of it does want to bring Hillary in, or another female, uh, if not now, then later. And symbolically speaking, the black man is the end. Symbolically, in the symbolic lexicon, the black male represents an ending. Black is is the final Saturn is the final stop, the period. So if he turns out to be the final male, you know, uh, prime president or whatever, it wouldn't surprise me. The symbolism is somewhat consistent. But then again, you see, we've got to always know that it's hard to predict because these groups are not all in, uni in, in uniformity. They have mm -hmm. certain rivalries within, and one side, you know, can defeat the other right down to the last minute. So there's definitely a move to get a female into the, into the throne of power in America. The whole symbolism of America is just drenched in that female symbolism. But there's one more atavistic group that says, no, we have to stay in the background. It's worked for us forever to not be revealed, to be concealed. That is the reason we've escaped so far. Any power we have is derived from that anonymity. Yeah. What are you thinking to compromise it now? That's wrong. That's against the symbolism. And others are going, ah, come on, shut up, you old, old groups. Yes. Yeah. We're going to move on. we got these chicks that are hungering for this power. Don't you know they're the head of every magazine, every perverted thing? has got a woman the head of it right now. Come on. What's, what's it? They're all too stupid anyway. They're not going to get what you're worried about. You're all worried because in the early days of your criminal enterprises, you were worried. It's like the mafia. And in the early days, they had to be real careful, right? Now we don't need to be careful. They're all on their knees. We can move forward. Don't, well, come on. Why not? 
we're bored anyway, let's, uh, let's, let's make a, a change. And so there's these two vying groups now, you know, one who just wants to stay conservative. I mean, these, atavism means that. It means rigid to the point of fossilization. Time doesn't exist for these people. That's why when you watch the media and you see these ad copy, that's what you're looking at. They're living in a dark age. Incredible when you start tapping. It's not even good to tap into it. It's not even good to look over the fence. It's so weird. It's like when the Medusa right, looks at you, you turn to stone. There's something in that that's very, very, when you look at when you look in those eyes, it's not good to know this stuff too deeply. We can, but we can theorize. We don't have to look over the fence, but we can uh, peer through the crack all of, a, all of a bit. You know. But then there's this new progressive group that goes, no, no, let's shake off these old robes. It's a new world. Things have really changed radically. Uh, it's, it, let's get the guys out of the way and, and, and all of that. And also, don't you see also, if you really think about it sociologically, we've had pretty much every other paradigm that the male brain can come up with. You've had neoconservatism, you've had liberalism, you've had all sorts of other manifestations. I think they've run out. Globalism and communitarianism is, in their mind, the only way to go forward. Every other type, fascism, socialism, I don't know what ism you've had that, you know, these, these, these more disingenuous faux versions, we've had them for centuries now. They've served their little moments, but they want to move into the full... Uh, Globalism. They want to. They want to have it all nailed now. That's why they're speculating about the you know, completely cashless society. That's why they're moving forward on the dumbing down, the Ritalin. You know, there's women again that get their kids off that stuff. But they're moving. Uh, they're moving to open borders. They're moving to do a lot of things that uh, seem to me to smell bad. You know that they're they're moving forward on their agenda. Yeah. So it wouldn't wouldn't surprise me if Hillary gets in. Um, but I really think that the two things that can stop that is they're hesitant to have any woman be too conspicuously in the front. Now, they've done it. You, ones could say, no, Michael, they've already done it with Margaret Thatcher. Yeah, but, but America of the modern days is even a light years away from England of the 70s. You know what I mean? Hmm. There's something bigger and more archetypal about America and putting a woman out front there. Some people would warn against that. Some people within the, the sister would warn against that, saying, you're making us too conspicuous, and if you, if you do this... Too many journalists are going to start asking about women in positions of power historically, and that all leads in the wrong direction. We don't want studies in those directions. And other guys are, as I say, going, get out of it. Nobody's going to study nothing. They're, they'll go, they'll love this. Show them a few tits. Show them a better skirt. They're not going to be worrying about no ancient secret societies. Yeah. They want women. They want the woman up there. They're screaming for it. And we want mother to lead the way into the global village. Like we said, right, we want to, we want the mother to woo you into the cradle, woo you into this, not Orwellian, that didn't work. It's the Aldous Huxley version, it's the smiling depressives, it's the affluent society dumbed down, you know, all that, all that kind of thing, uh, tyranny without tears. The male tried, we, we had the male energy doing that, kicking empires into shape, massacring the pagans, killing off whole nations. That was fun for a while. <laughs> Try something new, right? I'm sick of this game. Haven't we got any other monopoly or something? Come on. Yeah. So, so this is, can constitute a major change in the game. And it's, it's unbelievable. We consider women giving birth to men. The male hegemony is giving birth to the female you know, dystopia that's to come. It's really like the reverse, but that's how they play it. Black and white. Set and Horus. You know, it's just unbelievable, this duad and stuff they're doing. You know, and to get a handle on it, it's really unbelievable. And also this atavism does mean that there's no emotional bonding to the victim. What the hell do you care if 10,000 bees are serving you and one doesn't turn up or 10 don't turn up? They get lost or eaten. Breed some more. You know, so it's, it's incredible. And in other work, we'll be looking at little pieces that we missed in the female Illuminati. Look at the strength card. There's going to be a, a little Gnostic. I'll delve into a little Gnostic thing about Sophia again in another context. And so throughout my work, I'm going to be revisiting this whole story that we've set in motion, you know, in, in the female Illuminati and taking little pieces out of it to try and hopefully unpack those more. But leaving this main thesis there for people to dive right into and do the same thing, take, take whatever they want from it and, and then look around in their own world and send us stuff. We've got the female Illuminati website, so I can post pictures there easily, you know, uh, that people send us and they are, they are sending it from all over the world so that uh, 
we can get a handle on this. But then, never forgetting that the call goes out to womankind. Modern women, as infected as they are, they must realize that they are the biggest danger to the sisterhood, far exceeding what any man can do. And therefore, the, the, the sisterhood is mostly working on them through Bollywood, through just the whole circus of bull crap that's coming out of their sick minds, right? How they present models of femininity and how, the, unfortunately, the women of today are buying into it. So this is another thing that must always be borne in mind for the bigger, bigger picture, the longer journey of history in this matter. Well, uh, I definitely look forward to getting into that more with you, Michael, and doing some follow-up interviews as well. I know we wanted to do one eventually kind of focusing a lot on the sophics and sort of the history of that and, and really the more positive aspects. And we can get into some of these details in future interviews and also, you know, the upcoming uh, cards for Path of the Fool series. And uh, for those that are watching, definitely check out the Female Illuminati. You can get it at modernknowledge.ca uh, or it's also up on michaeltessarian.com and uh, femaleilluminati.com for a lot of the footnotes and doing some more of the background research. And uh, thanks again, Michael, for your time, for your passion, and for the work that you do. Well, thanks for helping. It's, all, it's, it's lovely to collaborate. You know, it's, it's a, the research aspect can be done in the dark, but when we move to the platform to get it out, it needs to be done by competent people who are passionate about the information and knowledgeable, not just, you know, reading labels or half interested, you know, um, or incompetent in other ways. So it's been great working with you and Chris you know, on this. It's, it's a great collaboration. And it's also, it also helps me in real time. Because remember, I'm also learning. It's, I'm not a know-it-all. I'm not an expert. I'm learning. And as I'm going, and the art of it is turning what you've learned quickly into real time so the rest of the world get it without these endless delays yeah. that I've had to you know, suffer down through the 80s and 90s where even 10 years have gone by before a project can be brought to light. Now we're doing it pretty much in real time. And that is, to me, fantastic, you know, including these interviews as well. So thanks, thanks for participating in that. And we, yeah, we'll, we'll do it again. Awesome. Well, it's an honor and any way we can help, we're here to do it as well. The people that are listening, you're the ones that fund this ship for us. You know, the fact that you've supported this work, this work was a monumental task, a lot of passion, time, energy, and money went into producing it. And so the support of those that are out there, uh, it's absolutely crucial so that we can keep getting this information out. We can do it in a fashion that is going to do it justice. That's really what our goal is. So I'd like to thank those that have tuned in and uh, purchased and supported the work of Modern Knowledge, Michael's work, the female Illuminati. Without you guys, it couldn't be done. Same here. Thanks to all the patrons and the believers, many of them working with me for years on that, financially produce, to produce and get this out to the world. It's not just a solo effort, you know, it's a collective effort and still will be done through the line. So again, thanks to all those people for doing that and uh, for ones coming on board in the future as well. I've said it before and i said it again, the facts that I'm sharing here are gleaned from an analysis of their own works, ladies and gentlemen, and their artwork, all right? It's all there for the trained eye to see. It's not conjecture or speculation. The etymology and the symbolism lead somewhere. Anyone can follow it, not just insiders. Any, anyone can follow it. You're spiritually dead is what's happened. You're spiritually lost. Take a look around. Which is, by the way, what, how, they, how they want you. Your umbilical cord is cut now. You're in Mysteria, La La Land. You're in sub supernatural realms and, and disembodied realities. You're no longer here. You're no longer phenomenally present. You have no relationship with the stuff around you. That's how they want you. No, you're in the malignant hierarchies and bloody beehives designed to filter out the good, the moral, be they men or women. Here's the symbol of the Eastern Star, the Order of the Eastern Star, which is a female Masonic group. We know now that that's the, the, the pentagram, the star is the symbol of Venus. Look in the middle, the letters F-A-T-A-L, fatal. Of all the words you could find, fatal, are we meant, is it, what, what is this? Is it the femme fatal, the femme fatale? And as we said, you just need to go out into the field, René Le Chateau, Washington DC, and other places, and you'll see it right there. It's almost embedded, because as she ages, she, she loses her virginal status and becomes redundant. So now she can be sacrificed, and there's often a willing sacrifice. 
her life time is curtailed now because she's just a channel, not a person. And she has to be replaced with a new version of one that's coming up, who's going to be a better channel, isn't it? That's the point. And we'll, we'll be dipping back into this concept again later in the program when we look at the technical advances of today's technological world. How the same thing is tying in, actually. It's not So it's not ancient, as we would think. Her daughter wedded the Duke d'Orléans, one of the most powerful leaders of Freemasonry, Grand Orient Freemasonry. He's co-founder also of the Illuminati. Well, his, his wife was the daughter of a royal figure, Henrietta Maria of France, an incredibly powerful person. He was co-founder of the Illuminati along with people like Baron von Nige, a member of Scottish Rite, or oh, sorry, the Grand Orient Freemasonry, and also Strict Observance, another Illuminati founder. And she, Henrietta, was connected to all the Catholic nobility throughout the world. Just as Duke d'Orléans was a Templar of Strict Observance, and she's related to the Stuart monarchy. She actually was involved in the fomenting of three wars with England. That's how powerful she was. But guess what? Maryland is named after her. It's Henrietta Maria of France. And right beside that, Virginia, Francis Bacon, named that after the psychopathic Queen Elizabeth I. One is Catholic on the surface, the other is Protestant on the surface. What's going on here? Well, behind the lodge door, those things mean nothing. These allegiances, they have allegiances that transcend all of that stuff, those lower level rivalries. In the Maya text, the Popol Vuh, we read something absolutely astounding. I've used this quote many times before, but it's always well worth looking at again. It's, it, it's harrowing. Let us make him who shall nourish and sustain us. What shall we do to be invoked and remembered in earth? We've tried with our first creatures, but we could not make them venerate us. So then let us try to make obedient, respectful beings who shall nourish and sustain us. The Sumerian creation epic says, I will create a primitive, man shall be his name, and I will create a primitive worker. He will be charged with service to the gods that they might have their ease. I mean, it's intimately connected just from you visiting there and even reading the signposts. You don't even need to open a book. It's just openly admitted. But what does that tell us? This is really very, very, very strong proof of the thesis of this program. Just that one fact. And, and believe me, that's not the only instance of that kind of geometry in the world. And anyway, 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 what are Templars who are meant to be Catholics now doing erecting labyrinths and dealing with pentagrams, aligning Notre Dame Cathedral with Virgo and other constellations? You think it was only done in Washington, D.C.? That's all goddess symbolism as we've just shown. But, but on paper, the Templars and the designers of that locale are meant to be Catholics. So what's going on? 